Do you ever wonder if people get worse as they get older? And do you ever wonder if as you get older, you're getting worse? If maybe just exposure to the world and living in the world has a sort of corrosive effect on you, boiling away whatever your idealistic outer shell was into something colder, meaner, and much more lost and frightened. That's one way of looking at the book that we're looking at today. It's Dancing Through Red Dust by Murong Shuetsun. Now I've covered one of Murong's books before on the show, in fact the only other book that exists in English translation by him, uh, Leave Me Alone, which was published, translated and edited by the exact same guy that handled this one. It's Harvey Tomlinson and he's our guest for the show. I won't say much more than that other than we are going to get to that interview. Um, before that we've got the true terrific news, but first one really quick disclaimer, something embarrassing, <laughs> an embarrassing goof I made in the show. For some reason I was misremembering a term, I thought uh, that red dust was Hong Yan or Hong Yan in Mandarin. That's just well, it's not totally wrong, it's 50% wrong. Hong is of course red, uh, dust is chun, not yen. God knows why I got those those wires crossed, but yeah, Hong Chun. So when I get that wrong later in the episode, remember, I corrected it now. Uh, so that one little caveat aside, we're going to get on with the news, the church of fake news, just four little things that are going on in the world of translated Chinese books that I thought would be worth flagging. So the first one, it's about the New York Times list of 100 notable books of 2021. I like that they've called them notable and not the best. You know, it avoids, it should reduce the amount of online anger that exists in the world by whatever tiny fraction. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because a translated Chinese fiction book got on there. It's Yanga's Strange Beasts of China, translated by Jeremy Tiang in a so-called Rococo style. Um, that's come up so many times on the show, and of course I've covered that on the show. I have an episode with both Yan, uh, Yanga and uh, Jeremy Tiang chatting to me about the book. So just look back through the show's... Um, backlist? Look back through the backlist? I could have phrased that better. Uh, look and you'll find that episode and you'll be able to enjoy it if you've not already, already if you've not already listened to it. Um, next news item. It's an article. I'm just plugging a piece of news in my news. It's an article that is called How an American Fell in Love with China and Chinese. And it is about a guy who you may well know, Eric Abrahamson. Or it's about him. I suspect it may have been uh, based on an interview and written up by one of the uh, newspaper editors. It's the South China Morning Post that published it. But in any case, it's, it's written as if it were in first person from Eric. Perhaps it was written in first person from Eric. And he's uh, relaying sort of his story as a translator with a big focus on his time uh, spent in Beijing when he was a bit younger. And his sort of formation, f formation, yeah, his formative time, his formation as a as a translator. And I think the bit that interested me is how he ended up getting sort of uh, very interested in Chinese language and lit, and the country itself. I think one of the inciting uh, incidents that he describes is visiting, going through the west of China. I think I think it was Tibet, then Gansu or something, and feeling like he totally failed to sort of immerse himself, or he maybe didn't totally fail, but he. Uh, felt a bit dissatisfied with how he was able to immerse himself, but that just left him wanting to have another go and get it right. And that sort of describes my two time spent in China. So I was uh, first in Zhejiang province, being <laughs> the foreigner who, who jumps in head first in the deep end and loves it and regrets it at the same time, and then went home and then had another crack at it in Shanghai and ended up not a, not a Zhang Guotong, not a China Han, but much more knowledgeable um, in a shorter amount of time. And then probably getting more out of my time. But anyway, enough about me. Uh, next news item. Uh, it's, um, well, this is more about me actually. This is a meta news item. Um, I just thought I'd let you guys know about some fun stuff that's up on the Trishific Patreon. I've got a string of new episodes up. I'm going to keep producing these. Perhaps they have been coming out for several months now every week. Um, I may not be able to keep that up. I'm going to try and keep up them, keep them up going up every fortnight. So yeah, just a few of the episodes that are um, either up there right now or queued for either the rest of November or December. We have my thoughts after watching Wang, Wong Kar Wai's or Wang Jiawei's uh, 2046, which is his sort of quasi science fiction film. So that's right up my alley if you know anything about me. Uh, the next one, uh, it's about a penguin uh, Zhejiang classic, Zhejiang specials book, The Road Home. Uh, this is one of several kind of novellas 
Oh, my microphone is vibrating because the train's going by. I wonder if that's being picked up. Probably not. Anyway, uh, The Road Home is a little novella that's part of a series of these novellas, all from the Zhejiang uh, branch of the China Writers League, I believe. Um, so it's an interesting item that I discuss both as a publication and as a piece of literature in that bonus episode. Uh, next bonus episode I'll, I'll plug here is I, I did a sort of a summary of my thoughts and my notes that I took when I was at the LEAD Center for New Chinese Writings Taiwan Lit and Film Symposium. So if you want to get a snippet, if you want to sort of attend that symposium, i.e. Com- conference? i.e. conference? Symposium and a conference aren't quite the same, are they? Symposium's like a mini conference. If you, if you, if you don't know what that word is that I'm dropping there, um, if you're not an initiated academic, uh, you can attend this thing vicariously through the, the this bonus episode. Uh, a couple more. I did a post-reading thoughts, or was it? I think it was a post-read thoughts on Lu Yichin's Far Away, a book I'll be covering later on the show, but you can hear my initial thoughts on it. It's another Jeremy Tiang translation. He's been <laughs> popping up in my reading a lot lately. That's not a complaint though. And the last one I'll plug here is that I did a, this is um something I'll be doing on this episode too, where I lifted a a, a section of my chat with Hi, Hi, oh dear, Jairo Morales, uh, the interview I did with him about the wandering earth. I asked him a question. I asked him if we put all the, the Chinese sci-fi writers into a big fight, who would be the winner? And if you want to hear how we reached our decision and who we thought the winner was, might be, uh, that is also up on the Patreon. So to, to listen to all of these, it's at patreon.com slash trichofic. That's T-R-C-H-F-I-C. There'll be a link in the show notes to it. And uh, minimum contribution is one USD a month, or you can give more. I um, do not have a vast horde of people on there. So I, I, and I wonder of, of who's up there, how many are actually listening to the things. But in any case, there's a treasure trove of, 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 of stuff there. There's, um, I think we're coming on to 70 episodes now and they're averaging at half an hour long so that's do the maths you have lots of lovely content there for you anyway last news item before i drag this on too much it's about Sinoist Books, my former employer uh, it's a small publisher who are sort of growing and finding their feet and are publishing lots of interested translated chinese fiction books and the reason i'm mentioning them here is that they've given their website a big upgrade it's now a really good place to browse their selection of translated Chinese books. It's all fiction. They have a non-fiction imprint called Aline Charles Asia Publishing, but it's the fiction imprint Sinoist that have had the website upgrade. Um, They've also got a subscription uh, package going on where, let me just find the numbers here, you can uh, get uh, every year, I think it's six, yeah, it's bi-monthly, so every year you can pay to get six hardbacks or six ebooks. Now the hardback subscription costs you, yeah, seventy-five pounds a year, and the ebook subscription is thirty-five a year. I don't know if this is UK only or global. I would imagine the ebook one that'll work anywhere. The print book subscription, uh, I think you should be able to get those shipped to you anywhere, but you may want to check whether that applies worldwide or just just in the UK. But yeah, it's a really beautiful site, I have to say. Um, it makes it makes me wish that um, I I would had been able to stick around with them a bit longer. Fun fact, Sinoist has a TikTok, so I'm I'm um, I'm getting onto it right now. But uh, Daniel, uh, the boss, the boss, not the boss, Daniel, the the marketing guy for the company, was showing me showing me it recently. You can you can check him out talking about the books on there. <clears throat> they have a grand total of four posts, so there's not a whole lot of stuff there. But you know, I realize now I started out plugging a nice website, and now I'm plugging a TikTok. I I feel slightly ashamed, so I'll probably stop doing that and just march us right into the interview. So you can hear my chat with Harvey, the wonderful Harvey Tomlinson, starting now. Right, so on the show we have Harvey Tomlinson. Um, he's very important in relation to the book we'll be talking about, Murong Schwetzun's Dancing Red Dust. I'm sure he can tell us why. So Murong, uh, not Murong, you're not Murong, you're Harvey. <laughs> Harvey, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Well, I'm, I'm Harvey from the UK. For about 10 years from 2009, I ran a small translations press based out of Hong Kong that specialised in translations from East Asia with Chinese fiction at the core. And I suppose our niche was as a you know, as independent voice, maybe veering towards being an activist press. 
we published writers like Murong Shuetsun, Chen Shi Wu, um, other Chinese writers like Li Ar, Annie Baobei, and you know, some novelists from around Asia as well, like Rosmini Shari, the feminist Malaysian novelist. So you know, I did that for several years. I also translated two of Murong's novels, um, so Leave Me Alone, which was his first novel, the English edition, originally published by Alan and Unwin, and Dancing Through Red Dust, which I brought out in the UK, that hasn't been away- available anywhere else so far. And I've translated a novel by Jimmy Chee, President Shaw, which is coming out next year from William Hine in New York, and a few novellas. So that was that was pretty much my life, or a big part of my life for um, for many years. More recently, I've taken a swerve into experimental syntax fiction. In 2018, I published an experimental syntax novel, but maybe that is uh, for another podcast. Yeah, well, I'll get in touch with my friends at the Experimental Syntax Podcast, and they can <laughs> they can get you on. But yeah, we'll focus on the translated Chinese fiction. And from there, let's go on to the basics. Okay, right. So let's get on to our book for the episode, Dancing Through Red Dust by Murong Chuetsun, a name we heard just a minute ago. So for, for listeners who've not come across this one before, do you think we could lay out the premise of the story? So not, not necessarily the plot, but the, the premise. The premise is a, is a society that's thoroughly corrupt from top to bottom. There is society so corrupt as to make moral behaviour almost impossible. Mm. It's, a, it's a sweeping novel that touches on every, every strata of society, from, from judges to convicts on death row, TV entertainers, t- TV hosts, um, judges, business people. Um, it's really a, a sweeping novel of 21st century China. Right. And at the centre is, is, is this uh, corrupt lawyer, Wei Da. Right. Mm. Um, so if listeners are thinking, hmm, I have a very distant memory that's stirring somewhere in my brain from early 2019 they or is it 2018 oh i've lost all sense of time but if, if this is if listeners are getting deja vu we did do murong before on the show we did the other book of his that you published leave me alone if you were to describe leave me alone i think in some ways we could make it sound a little bit similar to the description you just gave because mm. in uh dancing through red dust we have a corrupt lawyer or a, a lawyer in a corrupt society who is himself corrupt um, sort of sweeping, we get a sweeping view of his his life and all the um, corruption that it's completely soaked in. And in Leave Me Alone, we've got, I guess it's, it's similar, but the stakes are lower. It's a guy in a, I forget it's if, if it's a private company or a state-owned enterprise, but a guy in business who's quite a similar guy, living quite a similar life. Um, would you like to talk about that just now, or would you like to get on to comparing the two books later later on? Well, since you've raised it, I think there are in Murong's in Murong's conception there are links between the, the the central characters of these two books. One way of seeing the the, the main character of Red Dust is as a, a ten year older version of Chen Zhong, mm-hmm. the main character in in Red Dust. He's you know he's similarly caught up in the you know in the in the, in the swirl of a corrupt society, but he, he's ten years older. He, he's he's colder. He's more disillusioned. The flame of uh, of of idealism has 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 dimmed still further in him. Um, in a way, he, it's it's a bleaker character. And the, and the book, although the t- the tone is similar to Chengdu in many ways, it it, it is bleak, bleaker. I think. I'm not sure if that that came across to you. Yeah. Um, so I said to you before we started recording, mm. I read this one quite a while ago now, and mm. to some extent, because I read it so quickly a lot of it's blurred in my mind and a lot of it is sort of blurred together with leave me alone because of those parallels. But I definitely remember thinking, yeah, Wei Da is a guy who's very conscious that he's getting older and that sort of the clock, I guess we all, whether we acknowledge it or not, the clock's ticking for all of us. But with um, with Wei Da, I could feel the character knew that he was about to take the, the plunge, so to speak, into old age. And his only way of dealing mm. with that is to bury his head further into the the red dust, I guess, the the um, earthly pleasures. Whereas, yeah, um, Chen Zhong, he's not so long out of college or university, from what I remember. And yeah, you could mm. you you could feel that he's on, in a way he was on his way to becoming the the Wei Da sort of guy. That there was some there were some good intentions and passions left in there, but ten years down the line, they could be chiseled off 
that so your your comparison there makes a lot of sense but as well as well as the age there's also the the institution there's also the the, the structural right. um conceit of making this about the law the central institution of society the central thread of social contract um so so the the, the corruption of uh we die and his associates touches on you know, every every part of society you know it shows society that's that's failing. So there's, uh, as you said, the stakes are far, are far bigger in the, in this book. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, with Chen Zhong and Li Miu and he's working in, I believe the Chinese petrol industry. So there, there could be potential there to like go into all the implications of petrol and the oil economy, but that's not what that book's about. He's just sort of a sleazy business guy. Whereas here, there's some higher aspirations to talk about, like you said, the structure, the um, scary structure. Um, I want to keep us moving. Um, I'd like to talk about how we came across the story and our first impressions reading it. So um, I, I can start, I guess, um, because mm. I'm just the reader here. You're someone much more closely attached to the book. So I, I read this one basically because I I read uh, I had already read uh, Leave Me Alone. It's one of maybe like the third or fourth or fifth or sixth, but one of the very early translated Chinese fiction books I translated Chinese fiction books I read uh, and I absolutely loved it but I it's hard to know if that was because the book itself was brilliant or because it was such a immersive dive back into mainland China because through so much of that book the guy is popping into hole in the wall restaurants drinking a nice cold beer and eating some nice transai so Chinese food and me a guy who was had been back in Scotland uh long enough that I wasn't still mm. in the afterglow of having lived in China and being immersed in that world. Um, but also, um, oh dear, it's too early in the morning for this. Um, you, you were making making perfect sense to me. Yeah. So it's, it's reconnecting you with your, you know, your so that it's putting you back in that world. Yeah. yeah, back in the world. And it was in a, like the right sort of window where I was, I wasn't completely, I wasn't so newly back in Scotland that I was free of nostalgia but I wasn't, I hadn't been back for so long that I'd come to terms with being away. So it was a sort of a, a fun way to dive back into um, some of what it was like to be a, a youngish, slightly reckless guy at the time. But also I think it was an extremely readable, enjoyable book. So I had this very, very fond memory of Leave Me Alone. <laughs> Maybe fond is a weird word, given how nasty Chen Zhong can be at times. But um, that was a big reason why I picked up Dancing Through Red Dust, and um, on on one hand, I felt like I was kind of reliving Leave Me Alone. But on the other hand, there was it felt really different and strange, maybe partly just from a publishing angle, because the edition of each book I have are so different. The edition I have of Leave Me Alone is this small paperback book, uh, not too formidable, whereas the edition of Dancing Through Red Dust that I uh, got off Amazon is, well, I've got it here so I can show you, Harvey, a big hardback monster mm. in a white text on red and black great big blood splat. So I already got the sense I'm about to read something a bit more hardcore. And my impression reading it was, wow, this is like the, um, this is like the version of Leave Me Alone where the main character died and went to hell and then became some kind of bureaucrat in hell. So mm. it, I went in thinking it might just be another sort of um, hooliganish romp, but um, was at times just in a, horrified by some of the events that were being dis, being described and felt I felt complicit in a way I didn't feel complicit reading Leave Me Alone. And there were other times where I thought this is a, this is laying it on a bit thick and I was sort of becoming, uh, what's the word, uh, numbed, numbed to it all, but perhaps that was the author's point. So yeah, that's, that's my experience coming across the book and reading it. Um, I'd like to ask you what, what's your, um, What's the story of your encounter with, with this novel? So first, just to go back to the point you made about, about how it, it took you back into that world, the world of holding the wall restaurants, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, well, I think that is one of Murong's strengths as a novelist, both in Leave Me Alone and in Red Dust. It's the, it's the incredible granularity of the world that he, you know, he creates. I remember Murong was always taken by something he read once by some historian who said that if you want to know, I think it was 19th century Russia, then you're best off reading Dostoevsky, reading Tolstoy, rather than reading any historian. Right. And I think from the number of times he brought that up to me, he was quite taken by that and possibly had his own ambition to become a kind of historian of 
21st century China mm. in the Hu Jintao era. Right. Um, because I, th I think one of, one of the great strengths of red dust is it does have this, 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 this texture, it evokes the texture of life in 21st century China. Um, I mean, it has a cast of hundreds, right? Um, it literally has a, a, hundreds of named characters. You know, as we said, from judges to the people on death row, and you know we can we can see how they live in great detail. I mean, the life the lives of the rich, their chateau lafitte, their you know their their their, their, their caviar and truffles, their 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 cars, their their women, the clothes they wear, and we you know we go into into TV studios and see how that works in great detail. That the censorship there, and in you know and in prison, you know the uh, the, the texture of a of a inedible potato cake the uh the smell of the latrines the you know the precise layout of the of the of the dust so i think that um that um there's not a sort of conflict here between it being sort of taking you back i think i think that is one of its uh one of its sort of merits mm. Mm. what you mentioned there about the rich that's another comparison or difference that struck me is that in uh, chen Zhong's world people are throwing money around but it's like their salaries mm -hmm. they're fighting for bonuses and stuff and maybe taking mm -hmm. some mid-level bribes but like when chen jong is trying to live it up he's maybe going to a nicest restaurant or he's having a few extra beers along with his cold spicy tofu um whereas mm -hmm. Wei Da is just blowing stupid amounts of money on the fanciest hotel room he can get steaks it's um it's a whole nother level it's um i guess it's the difference between the middle class and the upper class basically Exactly. He's, he's using the story of this one corrupt lawyer, Wei Da, to show us how power works in, in China today. Show us that, you know, that, that how, how society rewards a kind of cleverness that can acquire great wealth. Um, and that is the only, you know, the only criteria of, uh, of social value. Um, so, so Wei Da's sort of quest, because the novel is the story of his rise and fall. So it roughly falls into two halves. The first half, he's using all kinds of business and political sexual intrigues to acquire a great fortune. He's, he's enjoying the privilege that comes with wealth. And, but along the way, he makes a lot of enemies. And then the second half of the book is about how he, they bring him down and he, he falls and ends up in a, you know, in a bad place. Yes, I know I, I was trying to ask you about your relationship with the mm. book, but one, one more comparison that's reminded me of I think it's it's helping mm. our conversations lighting up those old neural pathways in my brain. Um, so the thing about <laughs> sex, uh, that's impossible to ignore because Chen Zhong in Leave Me Alone is, I think the the term it's not really it's quite an old term now. It's like ten years old or something. But he's a, he's a fuck boy. He's just constantly messing around, messing women around, messing around with women being following his little brother his dd that's what's leading him around the place and so i kind of expected once i could see this way that character was kind of similar i thought right he's going to um chasing women is going to be his downfall and he's going to be trying to get laid as much as he can but it i think it became apparent fairly early on it's not clear that this guy even really cares about those things it just seems to be another mm -hmm. kind of sadism and abuse of power mm -hmm. and a way to further his own goals. So maybe this is the wrong word to use, but he felt a lot more asexual than Chen Zhong. Again, another thing that might have been, uh, what's the word, chiseled off by the nasty life he's living. As you say, it's impossible to ignore the the treatment of sex, but I, I, I see I see this as being I see this as being a strength of the book as well. Mm -hmm. The way that it. It deals with sex in such quotidian detail and, sh and show shows its relationship with society, the, the world of the world of power, and the, the dynamics that are that, that are at work there. So yeah, there, there is there is a lot of there's a lot of sex in the book, and you know in that way I would compare it to another classic of Chinese literature, 16th century classic Jin Ping Mei, mm. which is you know if we think about um, its place in the in the canon, it's you know it's a book that's seen as a classic, so it, it appears on these numbered lists that uh, Chinese culture is so fond of, you know, the five great literary classics or the four great Ming Dynasty classics. But it's also a text that's been regarded as an obscene novel, as a, as a sort of disreputable member of the, the literary the literary family. And a lot of that is to do with its its treatment of, of, of sex. And I think I think there's something similar, something similar with Murong as well. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of sex scenes in there, and um, there are you know scenes of sadomasochism. There are scenes of 
of rape. There are scenes of, where, where sex is played for, as, as comedy as well. There are scenes of, of humiliation. So definitely other people have found this as well, also a, a, troubling, a troubling part of the book. Yeah, it gets pretty dark. It, it, get, it, 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 gets, it gets dark. The, the, the fence for that, obviously, is that the, the Wurong is, is just reflecting society. And that as, as the writer, if you feel a sense of disquiet, if you feel a sense of discomfort when you're reading a particular scene, that's because he's created the frame. You know, he, the, the writer has created that frame. The writer has made you feel this is not just something to pass over. This is, this is not all right. So I would argue, just as the defense of Jinping may have, uh, have argued, that there is a moral, a moral frame to this book. I think another defense of Murong is that his female characters are well-rounded. I mean, this is my, this is my judgment anyway. He writes women as well as he writes men. He's not like a, you know, like a Philip Roth or a, I don't know, um, Ian Fleming or Martin Amos, perhaps, who, 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 who you know, is definitely a the writer whose female characters tend to be you know, a little thin, perhaps. Right. Um, Murong's female characters are very much the equal of the, of, of the men. You know, they're, they're, they're protagonists, they're, they're fully as smart, fully as capable, but they're operating within a world where, you know, within, within a very patriarchal society. Yeah. Which you know, is like just a realistic reflection of, of China as it is. Yeah, it's mm. um, another thing that you can't really miss mm. in this one and also leave me alone is that whether we're in mm. business like in uh, leave me alone or we're in the, uh, mm. the law like in uh, dancing through red dust every mm. power player everyone who's got a job basically is is a man and i would not consider myself an expert and i know from my own experience working in china like I've had female bosses, but I was working in, edu- in education. I wasn't working in the echelons of power. And like, certainly if you think of um, the, the top figures in, in the Chinese government or in the, the, the big communist party meetings where hundreds of officials show up, what's the, the mm. ratio of men to women? Well, it's, it's certainly nothing to brag about. And if you, mm. you could compare that to other, um, some of China's neighbors, like Taiwan and South Korea have both had uh, female presidents. Taiwan has one right now. So yeah, it, it's interesting to wonder, like, why has a country which under the Communist Party did do some quite impressive things to bring about gender equality in its early days, what's mm. happened since then? And this novel, I don't think this novel works to explain that, but it gives you a look at the world that exists in the 21st century. So it is interesting from that angle. But again, yeah, some readers might might be bothered by that. But I, th- I, but I think that we feel compassion for all the characters, right? Mm. Um so yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely, China is a very. I mean, if we look at the look at, um, I, I did some translation for. I translated an article of Jiang Chuan for the New York Times a few years ago. Yeah, she's one of the feminist five who is arrested for protesting uh, right. about issues like domestic violence that we would have thought would have been unexceptional. Um, or we could look at um, Shenzhou, the, the 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 Me Too. Um, the, the figure who's been associated with Me Too in China, whose um, you know, whose case against a CCTV host was 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 dismissed um, just just recently after many years. So so th- this is the world that's there. And Murong is the one who's shining a, a sort of moral spotlight on it. So try and make us feel disquieted. Having said that, you know, I I mean, I had similar feelings as you did when translating some some scenes in this book. That it was it was quite harrowing at times. And, you know, I asked myself, is there any kind of male puissance, if you like, that the Murong mm. is, you know, as a male writer is feeling from participating, is deriving from participating in these scenes. But I think I would largely clear him of that. You know, I think if there's any sort of uh, puissance uh, or coming, coming from this, it's, 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 his, it's his satisfaction in pointing out this is, this is how things are. This is how bad we are. This is what our society has come to. He's, he's rubbing our fa- he's rubbing our faces in that. I think this is this is what this is what he's about. Yeah, there is a. You could probably write a whole essay on the weird pleasure one can feel calling a spade a spade, and probably that's multiplied by how many other people right. aren't calling the spade the spade that would intensify mm. that feeling. I'm gonna leave a mental bookmark uh, on the Jinping Mei. I'd like to talk about that later. But since you mentioned being a translator, uh, could you tell us a bit about maybe and, well, translator and a publisher? Could you tell us a bit about this book's journey from an idea in Murong's mm. head through to a Chinese edition? through to this English edition that's sitting on my desk right now. 
well it was a lot it's a long and winding long and winding road excellent um well i suppose yeah i found i found in make do studios in 2000 and about 2007 i think it would have been would have been it would have been around about that time um i think similarly to you angus i'd i'd had a spell in china before that and then returned to the uk and i wanted to have some you know some sort of continued connection with china yeah and you know i was reading chinese novels in english but i wasn't seeing anything that really reflected the the complexity and the you know just just the incredible sort of pace of change there the modernism the, these cities like beijing and shanghai that were redefining urban experience in the way that chicago and new york did in the in the 20th century right. um you know at that time and this is a kind of antediluvian age in a Chinese fiction in translation. Um, you know, a lot, a lot has, a lot has happened since then. A lot of good people have come along and done incredible things to bring more Chinese fiction over, including, you know, including Paper Republic, Leeds, uh, writing Chinese program, um, your your podcast. But back, but back in back in you know back in the day, you know, I'd say there were mainly two kinds of Chinese work that would appear in English. One would be Cultural Revolution memoirs. And the other would be works you know, by Chinese writers who are pretty westernized, maybe even writing in English, living overseas. So there wasn't any, any wasn't really anything that I found that was showing, um, you know, the incredible, so incredible sort of pace of change that was that was taking place. Mm. So it started first as a website, and I sort of advertised and recruited a few Wenchua Qingnian literary youths and you know, asked them to suggest what they what they were reading. And, you know, because it was the sort of mid to late 2000s, the writers they were enthusiastic about, people in the in the 20s, were the, the first sort of wave of internet writers. Mm. There's writers like Annie Balbei and uh, Ho Jingming and, you know, and, and Murong. So, you know, we were, you know, at first just translating chapters. Um, we would contact the authors, you know, for permission and, and publish chapters there. And I, I thought I'd have a go at doing one. So I translated a few chapters of Leave Me Alone. And so it was just there on the website and then an agent saw it and came along and they liked it. And then they sold it to Alan and Unwin. Then I had to translate the rest of the book very quickly because there's no, there's very little patience in publishing as you, as you know, I had a full time, you know, I had a proper job at that time Oof. in Hong Kong. Right. Essentially what I did was t- I took two weeks off, went to, I went to Bangkok and uh, sort of locked myself in a hotel for two weeks. I thought if I did two chapters a day, I could, because I'd already done a few before I set off, I could wrap up most of the novel. I didn't quite manage that, but you know, I got I got close. So it was translated very very quickly, and there's a, a sort of rushness to the translation that was never, even through subsequent editing, that I never managed to to eradicate. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So I saw it very much as a, a as a flawed translation, but at the same time, you know, it, I think it, it did. To be fair, did it, it did become popular? You know, people liked it. Um, so I hope that it. You know, it captured some spirit of the original novel, which actually, you know, there's a kind of parallel because Murong was also originally writing this novel online, pasting it on the bulletin board in the company where he was working chapter by chapter, mm-hmm. um, with, you know, with no thoughts, probably for book publication. So there's a kind of parallel there between the translation. Anyway, I'm spending too long on this on this part of the story. That's fine. Yeah. So eventually, Leave Me Alone was published by Alan and Unwin. And this would be about 2009. And Murong then was working on his fourth novel, Dancing Through Red Dust. At that time, his lifestyle was to spend his summers in Tibet. You know, he, was, he, he was enjoying the life of a celebrity. Mm. You know, he'd, he'd entered into the celebrity circles of 21st century China. Um, you know, he, had a, he had a TV show. He, uh, you know, he, was sort of, he sort of, you know, could touch a world of, of celebrity. So he, he would summer in Tibet, in Lhasa. I think that's where he started to write it. And, and he would winter in Sanya. Wow. <laughs> what a life. Yeah. I know. Not a bad life, is it? So, you know, while, while, we were, while we were sort of editing Leave Me Alone, I would visit him there, visit him in Sanya, and spend quite a bit of time hanging with him there. He would, he would always write at night. It was this cafe he would go to. And, you know, he would, he would sit there all night writing. And, yeah, so that, that, is, uh, that is that. And it came out, you know, about the end of 2009. So, you know, I think, you know, one of my early thoughts was how, how could this be published in China? You know, even in the more open environment 10 years ago, it was a very brave publisher who put it out. Um, it could only come out, you know, he only put it out after cutting about 40,000 words and adding a new ending. 
But even so, as soon as it came out, the, the publisher was closed down and the, the, uh, the, the, the publisher, the head of the company was severely reprimanded. And, and since then, I think it's been, I think it's been very hard to, to get this book in China. Right. Yeah. Um, what you were saying there, several things mm. you said there were really interesting to me. Uh, so I was thinking recently, a completely unoriginal thought, how like as, as human beings, we're, we're born into the world in so-and-so year, and then we grow up as kids for, let's say, five to 10 to 12 years, not really thinking about that much about what came before us, or, or maybe we are, but like in the years after we're born through our lives, we do all, we, all of us spend X amount of time trying to figure out what was there before us. So that could be your mm. family history. Um, every about once a year some there's some drama in my family that leaves me questioning the elders mm -hmm. about what exactly did go down in uh, 1990 three years before i was born or something um and like the being a foreigner in china felt like no exception i arrived in 2014 so kind of just as the xi era was properly turning into the xi era let's say so mm -hmm. Meng was on like every every wall and every street and I think Zhongguo Meng is, um, it's still, still, I've heard it's still used in a party speak, but like other ideas, other keywords are the big words on all the propaganda posters in the country. So I was living there at this time of uh, decreasing freedom, basically tightening control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's been interesting me for, for me to kind of catch glimpses of what was there before in the Hu eras. Right. And I guess also mm -hmm. the uh, Jiang era. He's, he's my fave. Jiang Zemin. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a fan of all the memes about him. But yeah, I, it, it's as interesting as those are, I don't know so much about them. And this ties into another thing I wanted to go back on. Um, you mentioned how Murong started out as a web novelist. And web novels have been sort of a theme or point of interest for me through the show because, um, mm. well, I knew that Leave Me Alone started on, on online. And um, I've done a few web novels on the show. Uh, I think most of them have been wuxia, like genre fiction. Mm. But I found it really interesting to know that there were waves of writers. I think, I think they, from what I gather, this isn't so much a thing anymore. But like the sort of literary, or at least writers who weren't just trying to write kung fu or magic stories, had a, mm. a following and a presence online. And it's amazing um, to learn that there was a Murong show. You could tune in and watch the Murong show or something. That that's mad because uh, that's that's that seems to me inconceivable in the Xi era, but conceivable in what came before. And it's just interesting to think: was that ever going to be tenable, or was um, was the clock always counting down for writers like uh, Murong? It's just a crazy thought. Yeah, it was it was a it was a belief sort of flourishing, you know, sort of confluence of uh, political trends and, and technology in the early two thousand, the late late nineteen nineties. Um, you know, it, I mean, it has its root. It has its roots in the eighties when we we there, there were you know a whole sort of generation of writers who didn't want to write politicized propaganda anymore. Um, you know, writers like Yu Hua and um, Su Tong, um, and uh, you know then there were there were sort of movements like the, the Shang Hen, the Wound School. And the, the Fansa school, introspection school. And this kind of led in, into the 90s. Moving into the 90s, there was more, you know, as capitalism was getting underway, and there was more of a focus on individual expressivity and the and Western brands and, and lifestyles uh, became sort of symbols of a new sort of language of personal expressivity. So this was this was developing. And then in the, the early 2000s, you know, there, there were writers like Muron coming along and seeing the possibility that the new space of the internet was creating for widening the scope of the novel to cover topics like, like drugs and, 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 and corruption and, and, and sex. So, so yeah, it's a, you know, it, 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 and, that, and then that influenced mainstream literature after that, mainstream fiction after that, mm. yeah. So it's a kind of a it's kind of a brief flourishing, I suppose. You know, maybe historians will look at it as analogous to the Khrushchev era in in the Soviet Union. Right. You reminded me of two things there. Uh, first off, mm -hmm. when you mentioned Dostoevsky uh, and Murong trying to capture what it feels like to live in a place um, mm -hmm. rather than looking at the big historical uh, picture of something. The one bit of Dostoevsky I've read is Notes from Underground, which would make a really interesting mm -hmm. comparison with Murong's books. 
from especially if you looked at the character through the lens of self hate, that's a, an interesting thing. Right. Self hate, but um, getting back on point to another thing you said that interested me, you said the parallel in our, our experiences of having wanting to 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 keep our heads keep our heads in the middle kingdom by reading translated Chinese fiction, but also wondering about the gaps that were existed in translated Chinese fiction. Mm. So one thing I noticed early on was there is a lot of stuff, but a lot of it is sort of under a lot of it is under one of two umbrellas. Acad- stuff that is academically worthy or stuff that is politically worthy, i.e. sort of dissident or critical. Mm. And I remember looking for other stuff to cover on my show and to read and found quite a lot there. Like like Murong's books are just one example of things that either do fit those umbrellas, but in a different way or don't fit it at all. And I was just thinking, I don't know when his career got started, but thinking about all the books that uh, the translator are under, sorry, are under the belt of the translator Howard Goldblatt, a lot of his, Mm. the books that have his name on them are quite interesting that um, are, um, even if they are, kind of typical authors in the world of translated Chinese fiction, they often are just great as as a read or as a snapshot of a society on the ground. Did you, when you were looking for interesting stuff to read, did any of his books sort of jump out at you? I say his books, his works in translation jump out at you. Well, of course, uh, how God, that's a contribution is, is, is immense. Yeah, I mean, he, the, all the, those big names uh, from, from, the, from the 80s, um, Su Tong and uh, and and Mo Yan, of course, mm. yeah, um, you know that that's a major achievement. So I, but I suppose I was I was looking for writers who were who were describing twenty first century China. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm not challenging the. You know, there are many. There are many great writers in 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 China. But at the same time, it's difficult to ignore the the institution of the China Writers Union. Right. Not many and, punks and the in way there. That the writing is set up in the way that it, it is it is uh you know is set up there which which may you know which may seem strange to those of your listeners who are not china experts because i'm you know i'm guessing that this podcast because of its quality has a has a has a you know a sort of wide general literary yeah i'm often never sure how much to explain certain things and i think the china right. writers league has come up before but it could be worth yes. going into again um so I was, I was trying to think what what is it that's not in Howard Goldblatt's list of books that we might be looking for, and I thought punks might be a good one, um, younger, edgier writers. And there's a natural um, tendency to avoid sensitive areas, which imposes a kind of template. So it's it's safer to write about the past rather than the present. Yeah, like the, the countryside rather than the the, the cities, and. You know that's a kind of a that's a kind of a template I think for a lot of the novels that we saw. There aren't there aren't too many novelists at that time who were taking on the you know the complexity of 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 of, of cities. Yeah, different voices. I mean, the the, the the writers' union is a very strange thing. You know, you're on you're on the government payroll. You know, which brings a lot of privileges. It brings status. It brings identity. It brings invitations to conferences in nice places like. Hangzhou, it, it brings opportunities to be translated, recommended for translation mm. and to attend um, conferences overseas. Um, you know, it applies the, these subtle sort of pressures um, in form. So one, one thing I very much admire about Murong is that, you know, at, at the height of his fame, he, 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 was, he came under pressure to join the, the writers' union, to, to, be, to be brought inside. And, you know, he, he, he resisted that. Mm. And I think that is... His great quality really is his is his independence. His, uh, you know, he's an independent voice. Yeah, I suppose at that time, if he was rich enough to be, uh, what was it, summering in Maja, uh, wintering in Sanya, mm. if you're a commercially successful writer with an income, then that's a rare thing. So that would give you the the leverage to be able to or feel happy saying no to the state sort of stipend, becoming a subsidized writer because. It's an I have a very mixed feeling, not that I'm an expert, but the idea of a, a national uh, sort of organization for writers that will like subsidize the careers of great writers. That's not a bad thing in, in many ways. But the fact that it's so overtly tied to like the state, of course, that's going to create uh, problems, which someone like Murang, Murong would have good reason to avoid. Well, I think I think sometimes it's easy to forget the context, isn't it? Mm. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a country where presently 
there are about 81 writers in jail. Yep. There are more than 300. If we widen our definition of writer to include bloggers and uh, academics and, and, and the like, there are, you know, there's, more, there's more than 300 at least um, who are in jail. Uh, thousands of books are censored every year or banned. Um, so, so, and we shouldn't forget the end to which that that uh, that power is is used as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, for for Murong to resist that, I mean, yes, okay, he he was quite flush in the you know in the early two thousands, but he's someone who came from a, a poor village in in Shandong. Mm. You know, for him to to, to, have, to have that that status of being a professional writer is is a big deal, and he he turned it down. So I you know I respect him. Yeah, respect him very much. Absolutely. Um, right. I think we can move on to the next section. It's right. uh, yeah, we really should because we've been going for a while and we've only just finished the basics. Uh, so the next section right. is called I've called it Dust World, uh, just to describe the story, the sort of the surface. I guess my memory of the book is not really good enough to summarize the plot. Uh, you've already sort of laid out that it's a rise and a fall of our of our character, mm. our main guy, Wei Da. Was, is there anything you'd want to add to that summary uh, that you think be helpful for listeners to understand about the plot? Well, I, I think the, the, the plot is actually one of, is, is a plot of great ambition and originality. Um, so it has a kind of dual structure. So at the heart is, you know, actually a very tightly planned plot of, of, of Wadar's rise and fall. But then around that is this very elaborate rhetorical structure. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a book with many different with many different um, modes. You know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's comedy, there's, a, there's thriller, there's, a, you know, there's, there's Buddhist fable, there's, um, there's, bawdy, there's bawdy scenes, there's, there's, there's trial scenes, um, there's, there's poetry. So it, it, it's, it's a book of very elaborate rhetorical structure. So we have this central story, and then swirling around it, these 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 you know dozens of other stories of uh, you know of, of people who come through the you know the the chambers, um, the victims of the legal system, or the, the the people who are trying to to profit from it. So it's kind of it's sort of a swirling plot, as as implied by the the title of the book, mm. Red Dust, which which stands for the sort of illusion of you know of uh, of of the world. Yeah, so you said mm. Buddhist fable. Um, this is a term yes. I think I've literally come across through the podcast. Mm. Um, I never came mm. across the term red dust whilst living in China. So if I'm if I'm right in Mandarin, that would be Hong Yan, Hong Yan, and it's uh, it's stems from Buddhism. Is that right? Right. The the book has has a thread of of, of Buddhist poetics. So it's, it's, he's, so he's placing you know it's not just a materialistic story. He's placing it in a in a frame through the through this character called Hai Liang, a monk, who becomes a very fascinating character to Wei Da. So on the one hand, Hai Liang is a charlton. You know, he's, he's forever sprouting these, uh, these, these Buddhist uh, proverbs, um, you know, about the emptiness of the world, about illusion, and, and then he hits you for money, right? <laughs> so, so in that case, he's, he's in on the racket the same as everyone else. You know, he wants some money to do up his, his temple, you know, to buy a new car, to fund a trip to here, there, or everywhere. But Wei Da can't quite get over the feeling that Hai Liang might just know, you know, he might just know something. Mm. Anyway, he's, he's the best he's got. So this enables Murong to introduce this uh, and have a lot of fun with weaving in all this, uh, you know, these Buddhist fables. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a brilliant one where he visits the temple, he visits Hai Liang's temple, and he sees this thing that many visitors to China, including Angus, you may have seen this, where they have fish in a, in a kind of a, you know, plastic bucket. Yep. And you can you can pay some you can pay some money to save the fish. So you, you see, you pay some money you can you can catch the fish and release it back into the the temple pond. And then Rung describes how that, you know every night they go and they recatch the fish from the pond and they put them back into this bucket. So he's, he 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 takes this as a sort of a, a metaphor for the absurdity of life. You know what what would these fish think if they if they could comment on this this human fast you know of moving them back and forwards i have a a story that mm. a real mm. not a story an anecdote that reminds me a lot of that it was when mm. i was working in shanghai i was at shanghai high school international division shanghai Zhongshui Guajibu, which is this beautiful campus uh, which was mm. if anyone's ever read empire of the sun and i'm sure i've mentioned this on the show that was the internment mm. camp in empire of the sun it's where jg ballard oh. was 
uh, so crazy. But it's, these days, it's a really lovely campus. It's got one one pond, if I yeah, one pond, um, mm. which has at times has fish in it, often has turtles in it. Lovely place to sort of hang out, uh, whether you're a student or a teacher on a sunny day. But yeah, occasionally you'd see it full of these little orange fish, just like you might see at the temples, the small ones that they'd have in the buckets, not not full on big sort of koi mm. style fish. Occasionally you'd see all those fish floating dead at the top of the, the water. You're like, oh. what's what's going on here? Why is this cycl- cyclical um, mass death of fish happening? Is it something unhealthy in the water? And um, I I learned, I got a bit of an insight one day uh, when I, I was in my office. I was the writing center teacher, often also a substitute teacher in the, with a desk in the high school library. So I got to know the librarian quite well. And... <laughs> He was a very Murongian character. He was, uh, huh. I think, basically just there to relax. Um, don't think he was a trained librarian. A very friendly, amiable, often just left his desk to drive around the campus. Or yeah, it was it was a weird, he was a weird fellow. Um, and one day he brought in a red bucket with a goldfish in it. And he said, These are these are some fish that I got from the the campus pond. Uh, the biology teachers put them there. And I had to ask him, like, why? Why are they putting them there? And he said, well, they do um, they do experiments and they need the fish. It's like a study. It's teaching the kids about an ecosystem or something. But, you know, at the end, they just let the fish die. So I thought I would take some and put it in the bucket. And I was like, OK, uh, didn't really know what to say. And then he told me, he's like, you know, keeping fish is a ancient Chinese tradition. I don't think you would understand. So I'd say, well, I'm sure it is a tradition, but we do have a pond with some fish in the back garden in my mom's house. It's not an alien concept to me. And he said, yes, yes. But, and he started talking about how this was a, a cultural tradition and then proceeded to leave the fish in a bucket in the school library and then never like put any weeds or anything in, never returned them to the pond. And eventually the fish died. And there's no, I feel like there's no lesson to learn from that. But um, mm-hmm. if I'm thinking of fish and absurdity and life in China, that's like, mm. that's what I think of right away. Like what, what was actually going on there? Was I missing something, or was there absolutely nothing to get? Yeah, I think there's still a, there's still a, a very um, ambiguous feeling about keeping any pets in China. There's, there's, a, there's a vein of sentiment that still regards it as a bourgeois frippery, yeah, as in North Korea. Right. Mm. The the same guy uh, a little later brought. We heard a strange noise in the library. He brought in a little cricket guy, and he kept it in like a sort of a tiny little tube because um, mm. he was of the right sort of age to be going out with um, his fellow Shanghai uncles to be cricket mm. battling or whatever. So he's into that. And he really, he seemed to love his cricket a lot more than he loved the fish. And um, we we'll talk about <laughs> the reason he brought the cricket into work is his wife wouldn't let him keep it at home because it was too noisy. And he seemed to, he seemed really affectionate about it. And I remember, um, I don't know how, how well you know Shanghai. There's a great big island off its off its shore, basically, Chongming Island, which is apparently home to the China National Cricket Dueling Championship or something. Cricket? Yeah, crickets. Like, it's a mm. thing for the Shanghai Shushu, the uncles, to, um, to, to take part in. So, yeah, like, the concept of, of, of a pet, I got the feeling that when I was passing people in Shanghai with their huskies or their pugs or their Shiba Inus, that was... I don't know that like walking them in the park I felt okay this is a, a western thing that's catching on but when I was seeing these middle-aged guys and granddads with their birds or their turtles or their crickets or their fish mm. I thought yeah this is um this is something old and sincere and these guys really like their animals but at the same time like why are they in such little cages what's what's the body count and again I felt I'd stepped into something I didn't necessarily understand yeah, I mean, I mean, in in Beijing, they still have a kill policy for stray dogs. Right. Yeah. So where I, you know, where I was, I was living before in a kind of a kind of artist village. I mean, it's it like it's kind of real village, but within the Chaoyang district in Beijing, Hergodrong village, and you know, because it was a, a proper village, it had it had village dogs. But as this village was slowly becoming gentrified, and you know, the, the villagers were moving out and leaving their dogs behind. And rich people were moving in who didn't want dogs running around. Um, it was very sad. They they just just take them away and and to you know dispose of them. Right, gentrification. 
Uh, I'd love to keep talking about dogs in China. I really could go for about an hour, but I think we should keep talking about the book. <laughs> mm. So we talked about the plot. We've definitely done lots of comparisons already with Leave Me Alone, but I wonder if we could talk about the legal system in the book and like how it works. I guess first thing to say is the Chinese legal system doesn't have, in the Chinese legal system, a decision-making power doesn't lie with the jury. I guess we can say that right off the bat. That's right. It's it's a Napoleonic system. The ju- judges make judges make the decision. Yeah. Yep, and that's pretty important in this book. And so that, that and that's that's the crux of it because the key to the key to winning a case is is having the judge on your side, knowing how to bribe the judge. So the, another, you know, not the least of the pleasures of this book is the you know is is the rich um, content about how to bribe judges at, at every at every level and. You know the research. The, let me let me number the ways. <laughs> you know there are the the Marjan games, which are not really games, but just ways of giving money to judges, and and the card games that are the same. There are the the precious, um, the Ming vases, and the you know that are passed off as as fakes and um, sold for a you know a few yuan when both both parties know they're genuine. There's one judge who has a a Zhou Dynasty Ding as his. Uh, like a precious ritual object as his doorstop. And, you know, he shows how, how outrageous their demands are. Like there's, there's one judge called Judge Ma, and uh, Wei Dao is basically his bitch. You know, if he, if he wants petrol in his car, he, he calls Wei Da, and it's not enough to fill up the tank. He has to buy hundreds of litres. If, if his kid wants a football ticket, it has to be three season tickets. Um, if his mistress wants, um, you know, perfume, you know, he has to take <laughs> take her shopping. All, the, all this kind of ridiculous thing, um, vast amounts of money, and 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 the whole the whole the whole art of bribery is gone into in very satisfying detail as well. The fake phones, the unregistered SIM cards, the uh, the uh, you know the lockers. So so that that is definitely you know is definitely shown in in into very satisfying detail. I was wondering as I was reading it. Like how much mm. did Murong research this? Because he does have a journalistic sort of streak in him as well. Um, that's mm. that's quite well documented on English, uh, on English, in English online. Do we, do we want to talk a little bit about that as, as well? Yeah, but another another relevant fact of Murong's biography is that he, you know, he his training was as a lawyer. He ah, he's a graduate, right? Okay, Young Fa Dashua, the top you know political and legal university in 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 Beijing. So a lot of his classmates are are lawyers. So I think in this book he was, you know, he was drawing very heavily on the experiences of his you know, his classmates who'd followed that that legal career. Yeah, interesting. Am I right? He, he was to... about the age of uh, of Weidar when he, you know, when he wrote this book. He was about of that age, 36, 37. Right. Mm-hmm. Am I right in thinking that uh, Weida does have contact with his old classmates in the book? Yes, there right. is, there is a scene with his, uh, his, his class. Yes, there are there are classmates, and um, I mean, there's one character as well who's who's, who's uh, quite significant in the book called Pan Jimin, and he is the one honest judge in the book. So he he he's he's based on the you know he's he's kind of a version of the legendary Song Dynasty official Bao Zheng, the the incorruptible official, right? Um, he's kind of a you know an icon in you know, in, in Chinese in Chinese culture. But Pan Jimin, you know, we both admire him, but he's also a pitiable figure um there's this one scene where Wade goes to his door you know with 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 whiskey with you know with cartons of, of the best cigarettes only to see them being being thrown out of the window um you know he's stubborn he's stubborn to a fault and he can't win the promotion um that that he he deserves so you know we we we, we feel he's he's ridiculous in a way because he, he he refuses to bend to society as it would seem only sensible to do but we also we also pity him Mm-hmm. So I think the inclusion of this character shows that Murong, you know, he has he has a serious moral purpose in this book. You know, he, he's showing how in a corrupt society, it's, in, it's impossible not to become corrupt yourself. You know, as you wade into the river of society, as he puts it at one point, you, you, you wash yourself. As you wash yourself in the river of society, you wash yourself darker and darker and darker. Right. Mm. So speaking of careers, the last episode uh, of the show was about mm. Chen Ji Wu. Um, and we have Nikki right. Harmon as translator on. So I guess mm. he's not a perfect uh, match with Pan Jimin because he's actively trying to write stuff that's, what's the word, uh, 
a little bit ris- risky, risky writing. But the, mm. the, the fate of their careers from what Nicky told me is kind of similar. He he tried to stick to his literary vision, a, sh- a social critique, and mm. he may not have been thrown into jail or, or something like that, but the result is he's been unable to advance in his career. He's actually been demoted and he's been left in mm. this marginalized position where he's, it's, just, it's, not a, it's not a happy state and it's not a reflection of his, his skills or his integrity because the system doesn't reward those things. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's not just something that Murong's made up. It's a real feature of this sort of system, which even if it do, if it doesn't, I, if it if it if you've not transgressed enough to be thrown into prison, like uh, Wei Da is later on, you can still be sort of squashed or held in place and humiliated. Yeah, I mean, if, if there's if there's any writer who's paid you know paid a a price for his his principles, it's Chen Shi War. He's he's you know he's suffered suffered greatly for being who he is. You know, a person of great integrity um yeah about murong murong is another mm. and when we when we talk about the effects of censorship we we sometimes forget the economic effects right um you know cut off from uh, i mean murong has not published a novel he has another one now but he didn't publish a novel for a long time he's unable to be published in china his his twitter you know his his weibo his you know his his blogs were cut off um he he tried to get into screenwriting he set up a you know a, a, a script writing studio but no project could be associated with him you know his name couldn't be used so by you know by the end of his time in china he was you know, he was he was in a very very difficult situation it was almost impossible for him to to live let alone write and it's a difficult choice you know because for any chinese writer china is the source of their imagination their language world mm. believe that is is a, is a very big deal yeah it's not it's not some uh, consumer choice it's a it's a huge fork in your life i guess yeah, I guess we can keep moving onward because uh, I don't think I've got more questions about the legal system. The next section, so we, we finished Dust World. I thought we could go into Flesh World, specifically the, the Jinping Mei, that mental bookmark I left earlier. So I guess first, before we start comparing the Jinping Mei to, um, to Dancing Through Red Dust, we could talk about what it is. Uh, one anachronistic term we could use Based on what I know about the book is fanfic. It's kind of a fanfic of Shui Hu Duan, uh, mm. Outlaws of the Marsh. I I guess I I know enough to start us talking about this, and, and you can pick up. So it, from what I remember, it follows us. It sort of takes us into the the story of a side character of Outlaws of the Marsh and his exploits, where essentially he he just sort of is a he he sleeps around a lot or lives a debauched life and rises mm. to power i don't know if he has a rise and a fall yeah that, that's don't. all i really know about the story um i do know this guy is called perhaps amusingly for english speakers shi men ching mm. and i seem to remember there's an episode of my my greatest rivals the the chinese literature podcast they covered it and they analyzed it in terms of basically a guy using the the magical power of misogyny and also his great big uh penis to travel through the world assert his power get what he liked and the the victims are are, are the women basically so that doesn't mm. sound a million miles different from the characters in murong's books but maybe you've got a better better or a less less fuzzy analysis than me well i mean the, the, the book the book is a, is a lot of a lot of things mm. yeah but yeah as as you said the the central character is is a is a is a Character from Shui Hu Chuan, Shi Men Ching. Yep. Yeah, it's about his rise and fall. So he's a he's a he's a you know, businessman who you know rises to great wealth through his successful politicking and and, and bribing, and then and then he falls. Yeah. So you know, knowing, knowing that I was going to come on with you, Angus, you know, I was thinking about how I could introduce this uh, book to your very sino literate audience. Because you know, one thing that I greatly regret is that this book is very very hard to get hold of. Mm. So you know, about ten years after the Chinese version came out, and you know, getting on for around like five years after the English version came out, it's you know, for various reasons, rights related and publishing related, it, it's very hard to to find. And I, I view that as uh, you know, I, I, I very much regret that because I think it's a very considerable twenty first century novel. I, I rate it highly, and I think one way to explain why I rate it highly is to compare it to Jinping Mei. So one one comparison is, is the, what we've already mentioned about structure. 
So both both books have you know very sophisticated narrative rhetorical structure. And I know that Murong, by the way, I've never talked to him about this. Okay. I've never discussed whether he had this ambition to create a 21st century Jinping Mei. But I do know that it's a book that's influenced him a lot. And I do know that when he was writing this in Sanya, he was reading Jinping Mei. Because he asked me, one time when I visited him from Hong Kong, he asked me to bring him a, a complete copy of the book. Because, because he, you know, even, even nowadays, it's hard to, to find a non-censored version. Yeah. So I, I think that I think there are many, many, many sort of parallels here. Both, both of them, you know, show a society that's very corrupt, using the story of a, you know, one one sort of central character's rise and fall. Both of them are incredibly diverse in terms of <coughs> rhetorical mode and also in terms of language. One thing that makes made Red Dust a challenge to translate was it, you know, it's incredibly diverse language registers. You know, Murong's basically taking um, many different registers. You know, legal jargon, political slogans, pop songs, Buddhist poetry, gang language, and sort of uh, welding it into a, a literary language. He's taking the base metal of our vernacular. So he's, he's done what all good writers do in creating a language that fits fits his story. But you know, for for a translator, that's that's very difficult. But that that kind of um, diversity, which some have seen as an inconsistency of tone, is something that it has in common with with Jinping Mei as well. Yeah, right. Um, I was just uh, as you were talking, I was googling around to mm-hmm. find about find out about what translated versions of this book exist. The main one I'm right. seeing is uh, it's a very academic looking book with a pretty mm-hmm. ugly cover, uh, published 1997. But yeah, I think it, it's fair to say this one is um, it's I don't know what, yeah that that mm-hmm. by 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 um Roy right David Todd Roy yeah this is yeah. one I've heard talked about. Um, I think mm-hmm. when it's a Westerner talking about it, it's often an academic. But from what I understand, like among readers in historical and modern China, this is a this is a complicated book in terms of its reader reception because it says like here in the Amazon description mm-hmm. of um, the, the the product volume one, the final sentence of the blurb, it says um, this work known primarily for its erotic realism, is also a landmark Mm. in the development of the narrative art form from not only a specifically Chinese perspective, but in a world historical context. But Mm. um, yeah, erotic realism, that feels like a bit of a a euphemism in a way. Yes. Although I think I've seen somewhere the the, the statistic that only around 3% of Jinping Mei is the sex scenes. Interesting. Yeah. Right. It, it does have it does have this ambiguous feeling, not only because of the sex, but also because I think of the you know the range of sort of registers and genres. There's a lot of pastiche in there as well. Um, people are thinking, is is this really is this really sort of blue chip literature or not? And maybe there are similar question marks over Murong as well from from some people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would argue that you know his his structural originality and and his his language um you know the, the language that he's created to convey modern china is you know is one of his claims to being a really good writer yeah and i think another thing that has in common you know is that it shows us the whole of society as well there's a lot of, i mean jinping Mei is a great resource for historians of the the ming dynasty there's a lot of bribery in that book as well how to bribe a salt official mm. um you know, Ximen Ching is like Wei Da as a master of the art. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. He's a very different kind of bandit from the bandits of Shui Hu, I guess. Different kind yes. of crime. Yeah. White collar crime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Last thing about Jinping Mei, as I was typing into Amazon, so first I tried typing in uh, Plum in the Golden Vase and I got the translated edition. Then I typed in mm. Jinping Mei and I got this. I'll send you the link. Uh, <laughs> for listeners at home, it seems to be like a Chinese made anime toy it has the word jingping Mei in its name and i really don't i don't really want to describe what i'm seeing but i'll put the link in the show notes hmm. but yeah um couldn't another thing i couldn't ignore creepy creepy yeah. jingping Mei anime toys so there are i mean there are, there are there are even scenes that are paralleled i think between the two books right yes um, yes we should talk about that um do you want to describe any of them well i mean one one notorious scene in jingping Mei is when xi Ching punishes his one of his concubines he's been unfaithful by you know, essentially tying her up and in the vineyard and forcing himself on her you know it's a it's, a, it's an unpleasant scene that you know, tells us about about male power and that there's a there's a parallel to to 
you know, maybe the most discomforting scene in Red Dust when Weidar's assistant, Lula Nan, tries to, essentially tries to take his client. You know, she's trying to become a lawyer herself by, by, by stealing his client, using her sexual power. Right. And he, he gets his revenge by helping the client to rape her and recording it. He then uses the recording to bring down the, the client who's double crossing him. So it all, it all gets complicated. So it's an unpleasant, it's an unpleasant scene. But I think that, as I say, there is, there is a moral frame there, as there is in Jinping Mei. He's, he's trying to show us that society is cruel and, and the cruelty that comes, you know, from not from human nature, maybe, but from the, the society. Yeah. And I guess yeah. um, it, it's a way of showing patriarchy isn't just some abstract concept permeating yeah. permeating the air this guy used i guess horniness nasty male versions of horniness to mm. stop a woman entering a prestige profession shut her out of it and ruin her mm. life and at the same time yes. ruin his uh the, the other man's life um or ru- at least ruin his career but of course the consequences mm. could be far worse for for the, the the woman in fact they are they're far worse for the woman than the man because she's the one that got mm. raped the the I, yeah, I remember that scene really disturbing me. It also got me thinking to be reading that book in around 2019, maybe a couple of years mm. too late, but you know, in the Donald Trump era, when there was all that talk of a compromat tape, I don't know if you remember that. It entered uh, Western headlines for a while that there's a, mm. an economy in the uh, Russian political system, supposedly of compromat, where everyone has a, a compromising mm. tape or recording on everyone else. And it's a way of um, mm. establishing some kind of equilibrium where everyone has a new button on everyone else. I think there was some, I remember even someone saying, Putin joked that someone probably has compromat on him, but he just doesn't care. Mm. Seems like it's probably not true, but um, it might be worth saying. Do you think that, would it be, mm. would it be fair to say that in a system which doesn't really do what it's supposed to do, like we have the Chinese Communist Party, Communist China doesn't do what it says on the tin. It's not some egalitarian communist paradise. And then similarly, mm. similarly in Russia, there is in theory a democracy and elections. In practice, mm. it's just a little bit of a joke. Do you think those are the kind of places where we see things like compromat and a bribe-based legal system emerging? Or is it all just about, is it any society where there's power and money rather than a fundamentally um, opaque system where you can't make change any way apart from playing dirty yeah i don't i mean i think wrong is a is a pessimist about human nature i guess mm. so you know maybe if we think about the continuum of chinese philosophy we could relate into sunzi so in early in early confucianism there's the there's a debate between uh Mengzi and uh shunzi Mengzi is optimist about about human nature sunzi believed that humans were essentially corrupt and therefore they need a lot of guidance to you know, to uh you know to to sort of shape them get them on straight and narrow and i think that i think that's what we see here in a system without any 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 accountability on power then it, it becomes impossible to to live a moral to live a moral life and we see the victims of that and i think this is where there's there's, there's a lot of compassion in the novel for the victims of the system you know, there are characters like you know there's like, there's like this this guy called you Oh, I forget Lu Yuan Zhang, I think his name is. Um, he's the guy who gets arrested on a train. Someone has stolen a basket of peaches and he's fitted up for the crime just because they need to arrest someone. And he, he goes to jail for 10 years and it ruins his life. He loses his house. His wife leaves him. And when he comes out, he's broken and he, he comes to Wei just desperate for justice. Um, and Wei can only re- regard him as contemptible because you know, he pities him in a way, but regards him as con- pathetic because he has no power he has nothing Mm -hmm. um there's the i mean another really horrible one is the accountant in this school so the school has a building program and the the headmaster and the deputy head they're skimming off the top of the budget so they're they're in collusion with construction company using cheap materials skimming off some of the budget the accountant protests they they force him to to sign it six months later the school falls down kids are killed and the accountant, the one who signs the document, he's the one who is made the fall guy and ends up on death row, which is where Waitar meets him. So that there's real, there's real, there's real, there's real tragedy here. It's not just, it's not totally nihilistic. It, it, it's, it's a book that 
is in search of a you know, moral framework, even if it doesn't doesn't find one. Great answer. Um, I was going to say there was two things. Just let me think what one of them was. Um, oh dear. Um, yeah, I think I'll just go to the one thing I can remember, which was human human nature. That's something I find really interesting. One of the literary angles that I've been interested in for a few years was pessimism and how it plays out in literature because although lots of people in the world I think especially westerners do like to have a detached ironic distanced cynical view of things when you start mm. laying out like hardcore pessimism if you if you are really if you if you are open about having very negative bleak views about what life's for it where it's all going I think your average person doesn't want to hear it so that means if you're if you're stuck in a bad place, as I often was over the last few years, there can be some mm. solace in reading a really good pessimistic novel, pessimistic fiction. It's a question of whether that helps you get out of the bad place or cements you further into it. But as as a piece mm. of pessimistic fiction, I really enjoyed um, the the two Murong books in translation that that you brought out there in English. Um, <laughs> I probably got I probably. Um, got a little bit frightened by how black the picture got in Dancing Through Red Dust. Uh, but again, maybe that was the point. But making it again about the political systems, um, on one hand, we could say this sort of view of human nature and how the Chinese uh, system sort of allows it its worst instincts to produce a sort of nasty, chaotic uh, life for so many people is interesting. Mm -hmm. But it might also be th worth thinking about like how much of this is a universal picture of um of of all the societies in the world because as as much as we can um attack the awful things that go on in mainland china that's not the system that produced jeffrey epstein or prince andrew or mm. what was going on in the bbc in britain in the 70s uh with or what mm. was he called jimmy savile jimmy savile yeah jimmy savile wasn't from beijing he was from somewhere in england um do you think it do you think there's um a way to read the book as just a critique of power and institutions uh, without getting too hung up on the the chinese setting definitely and i you know i think that what what the book has is is a metaphysical frame as well you know as i said introduced by the character of hai liang so mu rong is uh, you know exploring this, this poetics around you know, reality and illusion. I mean, there are many times Wadar is driving along, he feels that life is empty, life, life, life is blank. It's like there's there's no he can't grasp onto, onto reality. The, the identities, the egos swirling around him appear empty. You know, he, he he's trying to find his way out of this this swirling swirling red dust. And interestingly, you know, maybe we could get into the topic of the endings because this this book actually ends up having three endings. It's quite an interesting story. The original ending, I think, is the one that you would find in the edition that you read, Angus. But can we? I mean, we can give spoilers here, right? Yeah, I think that's fine because the the blurb attached to this one mentions that uh, he ends up in jail at the horrific Taoshi detention center. Uh, the worst of human nature is exhibited here, and even as Wei Da tries to atone, the day of his execution approaches. And spoilers, cover your ears now if you don't want to hear it. He does just get executed. So we. Um, we get his perspective right up to the moment where um, he's uh, he's driven out to some kind of beautiful spot in the countryside and mm. it's just shot death by right. firing squad. I'll just read it. I like reading. I think listeners like it when um, we read stuff. Mm. I'll, I'll read one line, uh, skip a few lines and then go right to the end. Mm. Only now that I was facing death and had I learned to love, even though it was already too late. Okay, skipping a little bit. I trudged out with the prison. The sun was shining on a beautiful May morning. The flowers were all in bloom. The execution ground was in a desolate river valley. Far away, I glimpsed the golden temple on the top of Shoyang Mountain. A chant wafted over the dew-soaked field. White birds perched in the treetops. A cicada chattered in the shade. I got out of the car and walked slowly across the soft grass. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't worried. Death approached me step by step, light as a beautiful young girl. I held her in my hand like a, crist a cr crystal glass full of all the bitterness and sweetness of life. Wait, Dad, do you have any last words? I shook my head. Little by little, a shadow came near. I took a deep breath and gathered all my strength to hold my head high. It was a day in late sp 
spring, the flowers were in bloom. A young crane shook his wings and flapped into the boundless sky. I'd remembered there being a gunshot. I guess I misremembered. Um, but yeah, there's... It's implied by the crane taking off, I guess. Right. You, of course. Yeah. I'd totally forgotten that we have... There's presumably Buddhist. I mean, we're told there's a temple. We can assume it's a Buddhist temple because there's chanting uh, nearby. But yeah, that's that's how it ends. So what did you want to say about that? Well, firstly, thanks for reading that so 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 well. I really enjoyed that. Well, the, the first the first line was significant, though, wasn't it? I mean, look what he's saying. The, 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 the twist in this novel is that he discovers, both the main characters discover the value of love. I mean, this becomes a book about, about the power of love to provide meaning in a in, a, in an otherwise confusing and brutal, empty world. And, you know, so he's, you know, Wei Dar is in a relationship with this girl, uh, Xiao Li, who's 14 years, yeah, he's 37, she's 23. And it's a purely transactional relationship. Um, she, she wants money, she's using him, and, you know, he's, he's using her. It's very, it's very cynical and cold, and he likes it that way. That's reassuring, that's, you know, that's, logical for him that works but at the same time he feels himself to be someone who lives in a world without love someone who's chosen to live in a world without love no one loves him he loves nobody that that is where he is the, the way the plot works is that Shaoli betrays him um she runs away with someone else threatening to expose him to the authorities but then he he, he lures her to come back but then the twist is that she really falls in love with him. And over time, he, he learns to love her as well. And when they're on death row, that, you know, that love becomes very transcendent and, and meaningful. So, so it does have, you know, it does have this kind of, this frame. Yeah, it does have a sort of a moral, he, the character does go on a journey. You know, about, so about the ending specifically. Yeah, so, so the publisher found this ending too dark, you know, to, 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 be, to be public. He was looking for ways to try and get it through the gate, you know, to get it published yeah so he asked Muron to write a different ending so Muron he went away and wrote this ending where Wadar wakes up in bed you know and his his wife is there so it's kind of like was it all a dream but but yet the dream seems too real to have really been a dream he, he feels like incredibly unsettled and you know he's thinking about shall Lee, his lover where is she what's happened um he has a deep sense of unreality and then there's a knock at the door Who's there? And, and his wife goes to answer and come back and says, Wei Da is here. So it's it's actually a, a sort of terrifying moment, you know, of, of, of not knowing who he is. You know, his his identity is completely unknown. You know, we've come through this long novel and he 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 doesn't know he doesn't know who he is at the end. So although this wasn't the original ending of the book, it's I think it's interesting because it highlights the the kind of metaphysical ambition of the book, the fact that it was always, I think part of his Muron's conception of the book. He's not just writing, uh, you know, a political tract. Yeah. But anyway, the publisher rejected that ending. He didn't, he didn't like that. And so Muron went away to write a third ending, which was the ending that is in the, in the Chinese version that was published, where, where he wakes up and it was just all a dream and he's with his wife and it's, you know, it's all sort of nice. And oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bad writing yeah. 101. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. So I think when uh, when we when we bought this out, the book has Muron's original ending, but the other two endings are online somewhere. I think there's is there a link in the book, and you can. You can... Uh, good question. Let me see. Um, where if there was a link, where do you think it would be? Oh, what I can't even remember. Um, we've got makedopublishing.com slash Murong is there. Um, I might. I might try and access that if it's if it will see if I can supply that. Okay. I might see if I can supply Great. If we if we got it, I'll pop it in the show notes. Um okay. right. I've got another another little thing to ask about this topic of flesh world before we go on to the next section. Right. Um so I had carnality in here. We've talked a bit about that. Passion, we talked about why really it's a book about love. That's great. But um, hatred is in here too. So I was thinking mm. when you were saying about how there's no accountability in the system, uh, you mm. basically, you can't bring someone down from below in China. I believe the way to bring someone down is from above. So if you, if you are below, you have to appeal from above and bring someone down. But in this story, we have um, sideways attacks. There are mm. using underhand means to bring someone down mm. who could be at your your peer, your rival. I mean, one thing that stands out to me in this book and and Leave Me Alone is that our narrator, because it's a first person book, 
and his peers are angry people. They really don't like each other. And that's a lot of what gives them their drive is anger. And again, I wonder if that ties in with self-hate. If you are doing nasty things, you you know, mm. you can't be at peace with yourself. You hate yourself. You your identity gets damaged in a way because we don't like to think of ourselves mm. as bad people. Mm. Uh, and it can be damaging to sort of make I don't think you can make peace with being a bad person because acknowledging that you're a bad person is not a peaceful place to be in. So mm. maybe I'm overanalyzing people who are just made of words on a page, but it mm. seems to me the hatred between people in the books is a product of their own moral degrad degradation, which again is just a product of, of the system they're in. And that doesn't have to be China specific. Like mm. I would, maybe I'm naive, but I would imagine on some level, Jeffrey Epstein must have hated himself as well. Maybe not. Maybe he was totally evil and didn't care, but it's, it makes a lot of sense to see very corrupt people as being very, very lost people. Definitely. I mean, Weida is yeah he's 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 lost you know he lives in he lives in a very cold dark place with without any real human affection or connection with anyone um we can see this as a tragedy because it's you know it's not a tragedy unless there's a fall right so murong murong sets it up by showing us the young weida mm. you know who came you know like murong himself from a you know from a village and it shows how he was as a child he saw his father suffering the insolence of power, you know, being humiliated by the local police who they steal his chicken and his his father goes to the police station to try and get it back. And they, you know, they they humiliate him and, and tie him up and, and bully him. And, and then the, the, the young Weidar has to go and, and rescue his father. And on the way home, he promises his sobbing father that if he ever gets into university, he will study law and try and you know, bring, bring, make a better society, try and bring justice. So we, we, you know, we have the shadow of his earlier idealism, which is what makes what he's become, you know, by his mid thirties, this cold, um, you know, emotionless person, a real, real tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it doesn't feel so abstract because I guess I, I think you can see this a bit in, um, uh, Beijing Coma by Ma Jian. And even if you just watch videos at Tiananmen, most of those students protesting there have um, very sincere socialist, progressive, leftist beliefs, but they're mm. also democratic, <laughs> idealistic beliefs. And mm. I know a similar thing I think happened in Russia as well at the fall of the Cold War. It's mm. feeling like, okay, great, now's our chance to get a just world where we, you know, hold on to the dream of an egalitarian socialist society, but um, we'll um, have an open and free political system as well, which is mm -hmm. like, that's my dream. I'd love to see that in my own country. Don't think we'll ever, we're ever going to get it. Um, but when that turns into who's China and she's China, what is a person like that going to become? If, if, um, if, mm -hmm. if not a prisoner, then how are they going to adjust? And I know that in um, mm -hmm. Beijing Coma, one guy can't adjust because he's in a coma, but all his mm. peers are either in prison or they've gone into business. Um, mm. And they're maybe they aren't all, they haven't all become way dads, but um, they're, mm. um, they're, they've just accepted being compromised as a way to have some kind of a life for them, a nice life for themselves because they couldn't get one, couldn't get the life they wanted for the country. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Mar Marjian is a, you know, a hugely underrated writer in some ways. I think, you know, he's, he's sometimes dismissed as, you know, those within the system have a kind of interest, you know, sometimes maybe not a conscious interest, but we tend to act aligned with our interests, right? Mm -hmm. Dismissing Margiena as a sort of political writer. But, you know, I think, I mean, Beijing Coma is, is amazing. Um, the Dark Road, you know, his, his novel about, uh, about one child policy, you know, is, is amazing as well. You know, very lyrical, um, symbolic structure. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a really great, a really great novel. Yeah, in twenty, in twenty, um, you know, in the the year that the London Book Fair had China as the VIP country, it did an event with Ma Jian because he was excluded from the official events. Mm. He set up an event at uh, Blackwell's in Oxford, and to his credit, Li Ya was the only one of the visiting delegation who, you know, came to take part in that event with Ma Jian. None of the others wanted to be associated with him. Um, but that that was really great, and it's really nice. You know to see that right lovely 
uh, I really should keep us moving. We've been talking for quite a while. So mm-hmm. yes. next next yes. question, mm-hmm. uh, bad mm-hmm. boys and dissidents, or even bad boys versus dissidents. So you're mentioning mm-hmm. there Mad Gien and how dissident is a f- pretty reductive term to describe his books. Like Beijing mm-hmm. Comb is a huge book. Not everything in there is just political analysis. There's all sorts of strange and unexpected things. Um, mm. And this was something that I was, I had my eye on almost right out the gate uh, on, on my podcast. So like I said, I was trying mm. to at least not start off with really obvious, like emigre, dissident, political, so-and-so uh, writers. Mm. But at the same time, I wanted to have some edge. I didn't want to just be doing like Dream of the Red Chamber or something um, mm. nonstop. So I came across Murong and I came across Wang Shuo. Mm. I thought, whoa, okay, yeah. this is interesting. These are these are punks, basically. They're writing about um, loose, loose, fast living in urban China. And mm. having done some of that myself in Shanghai, I was like, interesting. Yeah. Why, why aren't people talking more about this? And I've mm. realized since people were talking about it when I was about 12 years old and I didn't know I was going to be living in China. The ship had already sort of sailed. Um, but one thing I did was I... I had academic access at that time. I was on my master's degree, so I could download any PDF I wanted from JSTOR. So I I stuck Wang Shuo into JSTOR to see what I could get. And I got, I found this quite nice essay about Liu Mang, uh, the hooligan phenomenon in uh, late 80s, 90s China. And I guess the term that is used more to describe the book, the literary side of that, pizza Wang Shuo, butthole literature. (laughs) Brilliant. Again, makes me think of the band Butthole Surfers, speaking of punks. Um, So I kind of went in thinking, okay, so any any writer who's writing about young men or women, mostly men, misbehaving, this must be a liomang, a hooligan. Um, But of course, a lot of writers or their readers wouldn't want their author to be described that way. Like Wang Shuo himself, uh, the two books of his you can get in translation are about way more than just being a hooligan playing mm. for frills is a very reflective often quite calm book and um please don't call me human is like mm. very it's it's very satirical and deliberately stilted in a way it's not just about lads going out drinking it's not really about that at all um mm. and then in murong's books it might be easier to describe him more as a leo man except he's not from that era he's from uh he's not mm. from like post-cultural revolution or, or even even 90s china he's a mm. turn of the millennium web novelist so i just wanted to ask you like first of all as a as an edgy writer what what mm. do you know about just murong's edginess both in his reception in chinese and then his reception mm. in of the translated edition so i mean when i when i first knew murong and we were going on you know we were doing events around leave me alone particularly overseas. Right? So I remember, well, I remember once we went to the, we were at the Sydney Writers' Festival, for example, people always ask about politics, which, which can be really annoying. You know, you want, mm. you'd like them to have read the novel and ask about the novel, but all they want to ask about is, you know, political, political rights. And, Are and, you banned? Right, exactly. <laughs> all, all this kind of thing. And Muran would always say he's an entertainer, not a political. <laughs> right. But even at that time, I didn't, I didn't, I did, I took that with a pinch of salt. Because I could feel there was a, you know, there's a level of social commentary and um, sort of moral questioning there. Wang Shuo is 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 definitely you know a very natural comparison to make with Murong. Yeah, Murong is he's coming a bit later, so he's writing about a you know world that's already developed. You know, particularly with the arrival of the of the internet and and so on, mobile phones. But also, I think his work maybe has a has a greater lyricism. Yeah, his his great literary idol. One of his great literary artists was Hyde Sir, the, the 80s poet who you know, committed suicide. And Murong's earliest literary ambition was, was, was poetry. You know, he, you know, he spent his, his university years writing, writing poems. And you know, all of his novels have you know, quite a lot of poetry in them. Yeah, so I would say that's a different. About, so about censorship and uh, you know, being a rebel. Although, although it's not an ostensibly political novel, it attracted criticism because it presents a dark picture of life, which mm-hmm. can be grounds for criticism. Um, yeah, like I was saying, pessimism is enough to piss off a lot of people. 
Yeah, I mean, exactly. Pessimism or, or portraying society in a negative way, emphasizing the, you know, the, the hey and me, the dark side of life, you know, the drugs and, and corruption and prostitution and, and so on. I mean, he, he was particularly caused offense to the, 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 the government of Chengdu, which convened a special meeting to <laughs> condemn him and his, his novel. But you know what? People absolutely love that novel. When we, when we were doing events in China, you know, and in this time, you, you would still meet the first generation of, of sort of young people who read this book, you know, when they, maybe when they were in college and felt an incredible passion about it as we, you know, we do about books that we discover at a certain time and that it really mean a lot to us. And his events in China, they'd always be standing room only, um, you know, people who are so passionate to, to talk about this book. I remember talking to one student um, around about that time you know, telling me how she, she read this novel in, in, uni- in her university dormitory and afterwards was unable to sleep. She was just in this kind of fervor of questioning and, and sort of, you know, th- feeling aroused and unsettled by, by what she'd read. Yeah, so you know, it, had a, it, had a huge, it had a huge impact. Yeah, that reminds me of something I meant to say earlier when you were mm-hmm. saying how you felt your translation mirrored Murong, uh, yeah, Murong's writing. So feverishly bashing out web novel chapters and then I right. guess later adapting them for a book, but the sort of the, um, the, the older medium still being visible, the fact that it's a, a, web, a web media novel, um, still that, that leaving its mark on the, mm. the final printed product. I totally felt that reading it. It was like these sh- quick, sharp little flashes um, right. dis- in some often kind of disconnected episodes with an overarching plot, but lots of stuff that you could call superfluous to the plot, the plot that builds more of an atmosphere and keeps you turning the pages. Because mm. I, I think there's a reason why in summer, like summer reads, page turner novels, there's always like a love interest. The possibility of something raunchy happening keeps you turning the pages. Uh, probably the same with violence, mm. same with um, mm. intrigue. As entertainment, as entertainment, dancing through dust is a bit. <laughs> that's a tricky one that because so much of that book disturbed me but i think at the time leave me alone as entertainment totally i think like it, when i was talking about it i really didn't want to make it all about politics censorship um mm. as i've been on the show longer that's i found that to be trickier because on one hand you don't want to reduce chinese writers to to their politics that is um that's doing them no favors in many ways. But on the other hand, pretending that dimension doesn't exist is doing the censors' work for them. And mm. depending on who you're talking to, they might want to talk about those topics or not. It's um, it feels like a bit of a double bind that is mm. just created by the system itself that makes it difficult for us. Absolutely. I mean, I I Murong, its genesis as a writer was was not political. Mm. That's that's my reading of it. You know, he's, he's, he's a poet, um, you know, his imagination is essentially lyrical and is interested in ethical issues. You know, he, it would be to have met Murong, you know, at the time when I first knew him, it would have been in a way ludicrous to think of this political figure. You know, he's someone who's fully participating in the celebrity culture of, of the time, but, you know, someone who saw himself as an entertainer. But he has that spark in him of a real writer, you know, the, the instinct, instinct for freedom. And I think that's, that's what pushed him towards taking up a distant stance. It's something that I regret in a way. And, you know, mm. and to the extent that, you know, I in some way was complicit in that, you know, in, in helping Murong become this dissident figure, you know, as translating his New York Times columns, you know, for several years and, and things like that. I, in a way, I regret that because I, I believe that, you know, it interfered with his writer's imagination. And, and it also made it, made it difficult for him to continue to live and, and, and write in China. Um, I believe his great talent is as a, you know, creative novelist, not as a polemnist. Yeah. Mm, yeah, that that's understandable. The, the dilemma of the publisher, because I guess just like journalists, publish, publishers and translators want to protect their sources. Not that he's your, I guess, yeah, he, he's the source text, creator of the source text. Uh, before we go on to the next topic, I wanted to ask you something about um, your, your work mm. publishing. Um, feel free not to answer this if this is a complicated one. Um, I remember that uh, the copy of Leave Me Alone I have, I think says it's published by 46 Publishing. 
And the copy of Dancing Red Through Red Dust I've got has the 46th logo, but I think it says it's by Make Do Publishing. So, mm. and I, I remember thinking, hey, is this the same company? And looking around online, I got the impression you just changed the name. Is, is that all there is to that? So in, in 2014, we, we shifted the production to, to the UK. And, right. and the sort of the center of gravity shifted. So by the way, you know, as because Angus, I know that you, you know, you have your own professional background in, in publishing. So our the original idea behind this from a sort of from a sort of publishing point of view was that there was this market for English books in Asia, the English language book channels in Asia. Um, right. which traditionally have been have been overlooked by traditional publishing. Mm. You know, it was always um it was always um not included in traditional publishing contracts of open Asia, the kind of a kind of wild west of a right. publishing contract. And you get these, you know, you would get these sales agents who would go out there representing all the different publishers, like grand cultural emissaries, touring the, uh, you know, the empire of English in the Far East, bearing the, the golden texts. Um, and this whole sort of infrastructure that grew up around that bookstores, English bookstores, some of which were founded by the CIA in the in the Cold War, by the way, and this, this kind of thing. Um, but anyway, these markets, although you know Hong Kong, Singapore, Southeast Asia, although small themselves, you add them up, is a you know it seemed to be a coherent, addressable market. So that was the first sort of idea behind that, mm. um, and it you know it went quite well. And in 2014, aiming for the bigger market, you know more room to grow we we tried to shift to the uk that's and that's when i decided to have a different imprint name of 46 for the books that will be published in the uk right obviously the number has a significance um so you know four on the six right. in chinese right so it's maybe a little bit positioning as a as a political press I, I, looking back on it i regret that i did that because i think it was just confusing that's that's the story that's interesting yeah i as a as an expat in um in China, or I suppose expat is a loaded word, as a Laowai in China, um, mm. I was often on the lookout for um, English language books because I made a bit of a mistake going in my first year. I brought like four with me, read them all pretty quickly, and then I was like, oh, now I just have to take these home with me. So f- mm. for my life in Shanghai, when I went back to China, I was just reading stuff off my Kindle for the most part, but I did start to sort of learn the places and channels through which you could get your foreign language books and um, English language bookstores were one but I found like the most uh, the best selections would be in like cafes that had books you could read off the shelf or borrowing from other friends Uh, Amazon was a weirdly good place to get English language books Mm. China Amazon.cn which was for buying most stuff far it was far inferior to uh, Taobao but was good for books Um, Mm. But one of the best ones was actually being lucky enough to to work at Shanghai High School. The high school library had some had some great books. Oh, uh, I yeah. read some Philip K. Dick from there. Yeah. yeah, so foreign language, uh, yeah, international schools had good libraries. There's no question there, but if you've got something to say, go for it. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole the whole sort of art of getting <coughs> of getting English books into China was a, was a, you know became increasingly difficult. But yeah. there were there were channels. I mean, in Shanghai, there was Garden Books. Um, Chen Wei, uh, the the long time boss of that, so they would they would take English books. <clears throat> the foreign language, uh, Shanghai, um, or oh, what's it called? There's a distributor in Shanghai that would take them and put them in the foreign language bookstores. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so th- there were ways to get them in, and of course, book, Bookworm in in Beijing as well was uh, mm. a treasure island of of uh, English books and played a very important part in the story of our press in China as well, with Alex and Peter. You know, an incredible, incredible thing that they did there. Yeah, it's it's gone now, right? It's gone, and this, you know, this is, you know, this is part of why, in 2018, Make Do kind of went into essentially I call it maintenance mode. Mm. The space for running a, a sort of a press like that, out of you know, out of Hong Kong, essentially as the spiritual base, you know, which had which took a sort of. A, oppositional independent stance that was just closing up politically but also also commercially as well you know, across across asia those english bookstores were closing very rapidly not just because of the the rise of the ebook but also particular issues around just the price of rents i think right it's hard for bookstores to, to cling on you know competing with the louis vuitton and the 
you know the Tesla and the big the big brands that are in those in those mouths. So so you know Page One and um, Borders, which were two of the big chains in Hong Kong, both closed, right. um, and Singapore as well. So you know within a few years, about two thirds of the English bookstores in in Asia had gone. That's sad. Yeah. So yeah, it is it is sad. I remember there was one. It was a quite a good Taiwanese company that had these really nice bookstores. I was, oh, I was, Elite, Elite, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. As Elite, they had a nice one in Suzhou that I visited, and I, I think I went to the flagship one in in Taipei as well. They were nice. Right. Got some nice English language books from there. I think Taipei. I got one of the laugh. I don't know how you say his name. Laugh Saido Hearn's creepy Japanese stories books, and the one in Suzhou, I got Margaret Atwood's The Tent. So those were a couple of the more positive experiences and maybe they were having an easier time because they were Taiwanese, uh, a Taiwanese company and a big company. After um, some of the Hong Kong bookstores closed, they, they came into Hong Kong as well. Uh, right. At that time, anyway, they would do all their centralized, all their procurement through Taipei. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Right. Um, we finally reached the final section, the miscellaneous oh. section. Um, oh. So this one... The first question is always the, the Chinese word of the day. I've got a couple of my own, or one one of my own words in mind, but do you, if you could pick a Chinese word to capture the spirit of dancing through red dust, uh, what would it be? Okay. You know, I actually, the one, the, one, the one that I thought of is wan. Okay. Wan. So this is a homonym so i chose this word because it illustrates so so for the, for those those of your listeners who are not chinese specialists i think this i'm going to use this word to illustrate homonyms you know the, the sort of preponderance of homonyms in, in chinese but for those listening who are chinese specialists probably the majority um or chinese speakers or chinese speakers even exactly um you know for translators the, these these issues of, of of homonyms can be quite quite challenging because of the, the, the word play and the and the sort of punnery that grows up around them and like many Chinese writers, Murong's very, very fond of this. So I remember that in, you know, in Chengdu, there was this, uh, in Leave Me, Leave Me Alone, Chengdu, there's this scene at the wedding of one of the characters when um, they're, they're ribbing the bride. Um, so someone is carrying around this, this tray with uh, several dishes on it. And they ask her, um, Yi Wan, Shang Ji Panzer. So Literally, that would mean, you know, how many, how many dishes are there on this tray? Because wan can mean bowl or plate. Right. But also wan can also mean evening. So th- there's a sort, of a, a, a sort of innuendo, obscene innuendo of, you know, how many times can you do it in a, in a night? Right. So it's just, just this kind of, of wordplay. Is, it's very, 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 very difficult to translate. So you know, um, do you cut it out? Right. Do you provide... Do you provide um, subtext, do you, do you stick with the denotive meaning and provide subtext, or do you try and sort of recreate the, the you know, the experience of, you know, the spirit of the, the original? So, you know, because there, there were two editions of Chengdu, the first, originally it was brought out by Alan and Unwin. Um, so in that, in that version, I went for a, a more sort of literal rendition of uh, just asking, I mean, I, I don't have, I don't have the text here, but it was something like, you know, how many, how many dishes are there on this on this tray and then a, a sub and then a uh, a footnote or an end note to you know explain there's a really there's a really sort of cool joke going on here but of course once you have a footnote it kind of kills kills the joke yeah but when when we brought it out in the uk i had the chance to revisit the text and you know, i had a, i had another go at um trying to make a pun out of it so so i sort of changed it slightly so that the the tray was a sort of tray of dim sum with different fillings or stuffings and then uh. the question becomes yeah how many how many stuffings have you had which which at least has an obvious double entendre right so you know i'm not sure which way was was better that's, but that's interesting that there's differences in the the additions because i had when i was looking through trying to get the public like i i know early on in the show for the show notes i would list mm. the publisher of the book um i think i stopped doing that because of reasons like this that mm. different editions will come out in different geographic regions right. and it's not always to right. track which is the the original um but it's interesting that those two are have some slight differences that you've just described 
Yes. Yeah. There's always there's always things that you you know can gain. There's always things that you lose in translation. Um, but sometimes there are you know sort of lucky gifts as well that come with the you know the translation. So you know, from one language. To right. Um. Just just for the record, which one shall yeah. I put down as the word the word of the day? Which homonym? Oh well, could we could we have both then? Could we have one for bowl? One as in, as in as in dish, and one as in wanshan. All right. Okay. So the next question, again, if I gave you these questions pretty short notice, so if it's too soon, don't worry. I've got my own choices. Oh, I should say actually, my choice for a word of the day was uh, "se." Um, mm. as in like color, because that can also mean, I guess, what like lust, explicit sexual mm. content of some way or other. And I, I saw a really good rendering of it on Twitter. Mm. I think it was Brendan O'Kane, uh, who's done some translation here and there. Mm. Uh, he rendered yes. that one as carnality, uh, which I thought was pretty mm. good for, for Murong's books. Yeah, that, that, that's a great book. And, and, you know, and the color, of course, as well, you know, the, the red, mm. the swirling red dust. Right. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, um, getting back to the question I was weeding us on to, uh, if you could pair a piece of music with Dancing Through Red Dust, what would you go for? Oh, that, that's, um, you know, I think maybe um, Carmina Burana by, uh, by Karl Orff. So for, for those who, who may not know it, it's a, it's a cantata composed in, in the 30s by uh, Karl Orff based on some medieval poetry. I just instinctively thought of that, and now I'm going to try and rationalise it. Excellent. I think because the firstly, it's it's erotic. You know, it has it has a very it has a very it has a very erotic feel for it, and I think that the Nazis it tried to ban it or did it did censor it. You know, because of this uh, sort of erotic feeling, um, and it also. Has a has a very sort of shimmering texture, which kind of maybe is like a mimesis of the, you know, the swirl of of, of illusion reality that you know through this through this novel, as well, um, and and also it's it's constantly shifting its its drive. You know? So there are constant sort of rhythmic changes, um, which maybe mirror the, you know, the shifting sort of rhetorical strategies and changes of moods of of the novel. So. Yeah, I think that's how I would rationalize it. Did, did you did you um, did you think of a, a piece? Yeah, I got a couple. This is this is becoming quite funny because I only started doing the piece of music pairings a few episodes ago, and every oh, time I was expecting yeah. to be asked about a drink. Actually, too. yeah, it used to be drinks exactly. Um, every time, literally every single time, my guest will mm. pick some nice piece of classical or um, avant garde like not pop music basically some high culture and every time i just pick some stupid rock songs <laughs> uh, so i've got two and they're both similar in the sense that they're an electronic they're a hybrid of like electronic and rock music um, but mm. one is one is a lot more intense than the other one is called the feast by genghis tron this is from quite a long time ago now 2008 unfortunately that's mm. That's ancient history now. This was when I was in high school. Well, oh, that's the year of Red Dust, the year that Muron was writing. Well, Red there Dust, you go. So Perfect. The con link already. Perfect. Mm. Um, so it's a really sharp, abrasive, loud song. I think it's a band, not a guy, but they're mostly instrumental. Mm. So in this track, they mm. have a, a guest vocalist. It's a guy called Greg Pusiato, who's got one of the mm. most incredible voices in this kind of extreme genre of music because he can sing very with a very powerful like conventional singing voice like ah! um he can do sort of like a more what would you call it like um crooning sort of voice as well but also when he um lets rip and use screams 
as vocalists of modern metal do. He's just terrifying. He's very, uh, it's really, he has a really brutal voice and not like a, not like a growling sort of voice, more just bellowing. He's got an amazing bellow. And there's mm. um, one light, there's only nine plus four, 13. There's only 13 lines of lyrics in this song, but the one that just um, really stands out he 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 yells don't stop it says feast harder i thought it was keep feasting in any case don't stop feast harder and the rest of the lyrics built around that say like while these old plagues spread one more need mm. runs low don't stop feast harder strip what's left of this toxic land stuff yourself again the verb to stuff stuff yourself with anything you grasp mm. don't stop feast harder still Our fate's compounding, our veins run dry, don't stop, this can't get much worse. That feels really appropriate for Dancing for Red Dust, mm. where this guy is just running on momentum. He's um, it's just total will to power. He's taking as much as he can, and ultimately that's not sustainable. That has to that creates a worsening environment and collapse. Again, appropriate because there's a massive climate conference about to happen in Glasgow, and you could say that what Wayda is doing and what Greg here is singing about is what we're doing to the earth. That sounds really, really cool. I'm, I'm going to check that out. The, the name, the name is worth the price of admission alone. Genghis Tron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, you may think of how in the novel the, the, feast. the monk, you know, this sort of avaricious monk will, will sometimes inter, interject by booming out some statement that just sort of hangs there about, you know, awake from your false dream or something like that. Yeah. So feasting, yeah. I mean, that's a great word. To, to represent the book, actually. Yes. And then the other one, this is, I thought of, this is a song I absolutely love. And it's a bit more, it's a bit more friendly to uh, your average listener. I put this one in my, the shared work Spotify playlist at my office. It's by a group called Health. They're from, this song's from 2015. So it's not quite, this is from the she era, not mm. the who era. Um, they're another American group. This album especially has, it deals quite a lot with sort of like, I don't know if you call it nihilism, but a sort of depressive detachment from, you know, the world we live in where we're all doomed mm-hmm. to die. And um, the lyrics really, they reflected a lot of the state of mind I was in living mm-hmm. in Shanghai. So the lyrics go something like this. And though we know how far we've come, we stay possessed by what we've lost and we both know love's not in our hearts. And it repeats that line a few times. And then the chorus, we're never going backwards. We're never growing young, not in our hearts. We're never coming back here. Remember, love's not in our hearts. And that feels appropriate too, because Wei Da is not getting any younger. And I kind of felt he is holding on to, He's whenever he loses something, he's mm. mad about it. He's always trying to get back something mm. better. So like the bigger bonus the more more crazy night out, the the more salacious mistress. It's never enough, and it just creates this state of melancholy where you're you're stuck in the past and you can't move mm. forward. And that was the reason I came home because I was I was frozen mm. in an unproductive stasis 
It's the reason why I'm in a grown-up job now, trying to get out of that that rut. And I felt that I guess a difference is that Wurong's characters are mm-hmm. trying to climb a ladder, but ultimately it's a ladder made from from red dust. They're not really going anywhere. Yeah. That that sounds extremely Wurong esque. I mean, I mean it, it sounds you, you you could have told me it actually came from um, maybe you know maybe particularly Chengdu. There were many. Um, pop lyrics, um, canto pop lyrics, particularly into mm. you know, through the novel. I mean, it's the soundtrack to the to these lives. Yeah, um, Miron has a lot of fun with that. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing about publishing or you know, being involved in this and that books do take on their life of their own after they come out and they have their own meaning for each reader. You know, each reader creates their own, their own book. Absolutely, yeah. And for free, people will do things like this. They'll make podcasts right. or... or offline conversations about about these things and then you get to know that they're out there okay next question this is a a thing i've started doing recently where the question will go up to the show's patreon and we'll just tease tease listeners on the main episode so um i don't know if we want to talk more about dickens or or keep marching on Let's let's keep marching on. Yeah, because I'm okay. probably going to have to go quite soon. Unfortunately, the time's just flown, flown by. Yeah, it always does, and then I have to edit the thing for yeah, days it's on it. It's going to be hard for you. Yes, that's all right. Um, okay, so final questions. Mm. Uh, if our listeners want more books like this, where could we direct them? Well, I guess the the obvious answer is uh, "Leave Me Alone" as well as "Dancing Through Red Dust." So aside from that one what book would you shove into listeners' hands? Well, I mean, first of all, though, as I mentioned earlier, I very much regret that this book is hard to get. In fact, I'm quite curious, Angus, as to how you managed to, to get hold of a copy. Uh, I think it was Amazon, possibly secondhand. So there were still a few copies Just... on, on Amazon. Yeah, perhaps secondhand mm-hmm. copies. Yeah. Um, there's a very complicated rights situation around the book, which, which meant that um, you know, it could only come out in the UK. There's no, e- there's no e-book edition. Um, and it was only available for a, a short time. Um, you know, I hope that one day it can be more available. If any of your listeners who, you know, perhaps particularly outside the UK, who you know, are interested in what they've heard and would, would like to have a look at the book, they're welcome to um, you know, reach out to me. You know, I could probably help them to, you know, to get access to the, to the book. And if for further reading, what would you recommend? Other, 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 other book, Chinese, specifically Chinese doesn't have to be uh but it certainly could be i mean other other writers is suza chen um side class characters or sort of underside of uh, of chinese life perhaps um shang Ke's first novel northern northern girls oh yeah yeah it's another you know very passionate very you know very good first novel i think it has that great like like leave me alone it has that first novel quality of just pouring out of just having to be written maybe not that sophisticated in terms of narrative but yeah, that that is a good raw read as well. Yeah, those those are the two that come to mind immediately. Okay, and I'll supplement that. I'm going to say notes from underground. Right. Yeah. Mr. Dostoevsky. Yeah. Or you know, I would think I would think of um, you know, if, we, if we're going beyond China, Theodore Dreiser. You know, novels like American Tragedy and uh, Sister Carrie. You know, with their sprawling social canvas, their their drama and their pathos and their emotion, um, social commentary. I think they're comparable. And, and of course, Jinping Mei as well, I think, mm. is a good parallel. Right. Mm. Just type that in, Jinping Mei. Jinping Mei. Okay. And last question of all, what are you reading just now? In 2018, I sort of stepped back from running the press full time, which I've been, I mean, it's been pretty immersive. Some of your other listeners will probably have been through this too. That it's, it's a very immersive experience running, running a a press very consuming so mm. and in that time i was mainly reading chinese fiction or asian fiction <clears throat> so one nice thing about stepping back from that has been able to to broaden my reading i've been reading a lot of experimental fiction because that's that's sort of become my main interest in the last few years so there were writers like lance olsen and uh, davis schneiderman um and eckert geddes uh, american writers who you know are doing sort of interesting things around language and uh, representation and that's kind of quite satisfying because that's not something you find too much of in in Chinese fiction you for the most part hewing to the you know linear narratives and uh, characters with 
discernible motivations and you know, the sort of conventions of the realist novel, maybe with a bit of magic realism sprinkled in. So that's that's been kind of nice, you know, because there's, there's a lot that I missed over the, over the two years. There's a lot lot of lot of things that have passed me by. Yeah, I know the feeling. Um, is there any one book out of those authors you'd like to name? You know what you know what I read recently. I never I never read before. Things fall apart. Um, oh right. I came. I actually actually never never read that, and I had the course to to read it um, just recently. And you know, it's a pretty 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 tremendous. Uh, Pretty tremendous novel, and you know it's it's one of those books that uh, has influenced so much that came after it. That going back to it, I felt you know that I'm I could understood or relate to it you know through the prism of these you know other books. You know, writers like my Paul, for example. Excellent. I guess I'll throw in the book I'm reading just now. It's yeah. uh it's translated Taiwanese fiction. It's Far Away by Lo Yi Chin. Okay. Um, about a guy from a totally different from anything Murong's done. I would say. Although you could make a comparison. So it's a, a Taiwanese, uh, I guess, middle-aged man whose father has gone back to the mainland uh, for a holiday to, I think, to Jiangxi, where he's from, and the father has fallen mm. ill. So the son has to head out to this strange land he's never lived in, meet his estranged uh, cousins born through a different mother, I believe, mm. and try and like get his dad back. And he has to navigate through the hospital system. So actually, no, now that I think of it, it's very dancing through Red Dusk esque because oh. he has to. You learn about all the different people he has to shove mm. renminbi's or um, cognac into their hands to try and get the necessary favors to get the right mm. medicines or treatments mm. or hospital beds for his dad. So. I guess it's a similar, in some ways, trip through the um, uh, insanity-inducing uh, systems where you know mm. you can't grease the wheels with accountability, so you grease the wheels mm. with with money. But the difference is, it's from the perspective of an outsider, an outsider who's Han Chinese, but feels mm. like he's from a different planet because he's from Taiwan. So there's, I didn't think it was relevant, but as I started to t- describe the yeah. book, maybe it is a relevant comparison. Interesting. You've made me want to read that. Mm. That's um, recently, well, I'm reading a reviewer's copy, but I believe that's out now from Columbia University Press. Mm. And it's translated by Jeremy Tiang, who's a really great mm. translator. So it reads really nicely in English. Mm. So yeah, um, I'll be doing an episode on that one, hopefully. Uh, that's all, I guess. Uh, that's all my questions. So anything you want to add before I uh, stop recording? Um, well, perhaps I can mention I have a have a translation coming out next year. Oh, okay, um, translation great. of um, Jimmy Chee's novel President Cho coming out from William Hine in New York in March. I'm very very happy about this because it's you know like like I think like so many books, it's been a long journey to you know for it to come in English. Um, it's been out there for a long time, so you know it's it's exciting that that's going to have its chance to find to find readers. Congratulations. Yeah. So I think that's that's it. Yeah. That's your lot. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show and hope to have you on again or maybe meet you out there in the real world of the red dust at some point. Thanks, thanks. It's been fun. Okay, interview's over. So here's normally where I'd put the plugs. But guess what? I'm not going to um, lump any of those onto you today. I just thought I'd give you a little nugget if you've made it all the way to the end of the episode and you're still listening. Well, I'll tell you what I got up to last weekend. Uh, I went down to London and I met two really interesting people. I met uh, the journalist Caroline Kahn, who's somewhat recently brought out a book called Under Red Skies, which is a memoir of her and her family's life in China across multiple generations. So kind of joining whatever that particular subgenre of of book is, I guess. But um, I can vouch that she's very nice and very friendly. And do you know who else is really nice and really friendly? Murong. I actually met the guy himself. So this was, you know, even more eccentric, even more exciting than chatting to Harvey for so long was a chance to, uh, no offense to Harvey, by the way, but spending an afternoon with Murong in London um, I wonder if you can guess what we did. We walked around the British Museum uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's all we did really. We were in there for hours and then we had a chat um, over some tea. Um, I asked for like a British style, but I said ying shi nai cha and uh, he didn't really know what I meant. He thought I meant like a milk tea, milk tea, uh, like Asian style. So he came back with a fruit tea. <laughs> um, it was his treat. 
I guess just like one of his novels, except except instead of multiple bottles of beer or whiskey and a hot pot or a steak, it was um, muffins and tea for, for me and Carl and Can. But yeah, I, I'm not trying to make you guys feel jealous. I just thought I'd let you know that it's gone from a show where I was sat in my room in Edinburgh facing the wall, like a wall facer from Three Body Problem, feeling very lonely but having a lot of fun. And now I still feel lonely, but uh, I'm less lonely <laughs> um, and I still have fun. Yeah, so just to let you know, I do exist offline in the real world and that's becoming more possible now that covid is um not can i say why i I will dare to say winding down and i hope i haven't jinxed it but yeah um, likewise if you'd like to hang out if you're in the uk ideally somewhere near uh, cheshire or manchester but if you are somewhere else and you want to hang out just literally just get in touch i i um i i'm sure i'll have time to talk to anyone about chinese lit same goes for online of course you can um just just look for the show's social media i won't bother plugging it with all the different usernames but we're on social media that's the way to talk to me uh, of course final plug is what you can do for the show the very best thing spread the word of course now tell your friends tell your family tell your teachers and tell the jury even though of course it's futile they've got no decision making power who you really need to tell is the judge, and if he's subscribing to this podcast, he will achieve enlightenment, and he will see that inside you, the scummy, terrible person, there is a shining Buddha who deserves not to suffer death by firing squad. So on that optimistic note, I will say, Zai Jian. <laughs>